If you grew up in the 2000s, much like this guy over here, you most likely remember watching at least one M. Night Shyamalan movie. Maybe The Village, maybe The Sign by Ace of Base, perhaps Unshakable starring a Bruce Willis, or maybe Six Pence also starring a Bruce Willis, but he's a skeleton? Over the years M. Night Shyamalan has developed a sort of a reputation uh, of not being very good at making movies. But I kind of feel like people tend to forget that when M. Night first emerged, he was kind of considered the next Steven Spielberg. Most critics praised his early movies and the audiences loved them as well. And I mean, taking a look at his first films, or at least what people consider to be his first films, more on that later, we have Sixth Sense, Banger, followed by Unbreakable, another banger, followed by Signs, certified banger. But if you ask some people, there was also something going on with signs. Usually it's kind of hard to put your finger on exactly what it is. It might be the dialogue, the early 2000s CGI, or the way Joaquin Phoenix reacts when seeing aliens on the TV. Whatever the case, some people thought that signs just felt a bit off. Surely, however, that was just a one-time thing. Right? After signs came the village, and then Lady in the Water, followed by The Happening, and one that I fear to even mention the name of, After Earth, The Visit, Split, Glass, Old Knock at the Cabin, and I think that somewhere along the line we all just kinda unanimously realized that M. Night Shyamalan is not a great director, nor is he a great writer, unfortunately. Ever hear that saying that even a broken clock is right twice a day? Uh, M. Night is unfortunately kind of the living embodiment of that, uh, except uh, there's three of them. It's, it's like a four-dimensional watch, don't worry about it. And over the years you've seen the jokes, you've seen the parodies, the memes, the skits, and to be fair, <laughs> A lot of this kind of deserves getting clowned on. There's the stilted dialogue, the shoddy special effects, uninteresting settings, unbelievable characters with unrelatable character arcs, nonsensical plot lines, and half-assed plot twists, and yeah, the plot twist. That kind of became the M. Night Shyamalan trademark thing, didn't it? To make you watch a thing thinking that you know exactly what's going on, but then another thing was actually happening. Oh, well, but guess what? After the third or so time, you kind of pick up on the fact that if I go for that bottle of delicious gamer juice, that stick is gonna get pulled away by a rope and I'm gonna be stuck under the box again. After having watched through M. Night's entire filmography, I can confidently say that after Signs, or even Unbreakable, M. Night hasn't really directed anything worthwhile. It seems like M. Night lacks a basic understanding of how to direct people, how to write emotions that will resonate with others, how to, yeah, just tell a good story. And probably most critically, M. Night Shyamalan doesn't understand people. And hot take here, it's kind of a vital component to being a good storyteller to understand other people. You need to understand people to be able to touch people's heart. You need to understand an audience to be able to know what the audience wants. I'd even argue that you need to know what the audience doesn't even know yet that they want. But you also need to understand people to be able to write people, to be able to craft a fictional person so believable that a fully developed adult brain fully accepts them as an actual person for about 90 to 120 minutes. Again, understanding people is kind of a core element to being a good storyteller, and M. Night Shyamalan doesn't understand people, hence M. Night Shyamalan is not a very good storyteller. Except... Except, I guess, for that one scene in Signs where Mel Gibson's character, a single father of two, realizes that the world, as he and his family knows it at least, is rapidly deteriorating around them, and in a desperate attempt to uphold a sort of normality for his children and his brother, he decides to organize what is essentially their own personal Last Supper. And there he sits, this ex-priest, this former man of God, this current father of a motherless family, at the very end of the table, surrounded by his family and their favorite foods. Chicken teriyaki, spaghetti, french toast, mashed potatoes. One final happy moment in God knows how long. 
but it is anything but happy. His son suggests saying a prayer, but having lost his faith in God after the brutal death of his wife six months earlier, the father firmly states that not another minute of his life will be wasted on prayer, to which his son responds that he hates him and that he let his mother die. The father gives pause and then replies, that's fine, his face telling a different story. His defenses crumbling, his efforts to distract his family like pieces of scotch tape over a pulsating flesh wound, a single drop of glue in the cracks of a mirror shattered beyond repair. And under this pressure of being the rock of the family, the father lashes out in anger. Now we're going to enjoy this meal. No one can stop us from enjoying this meal, so enjoy it. Followed by possibly the hardest task ever asked from Mel Gibson or any other actor for that matter, eating mashed potatoes and breaking down crying at the same time. A feat that on paper shouldn't work, but in practice hits so hard. Okay, yeah, I guess that's a decent scene, but it's not or that one scene in Unbreakable where Bruce Willis' son is suddenly pointing a loaded revolver at him in the kitchen, convinced, like many boys are, that his father is a superhero capable of anything, even deflecting bullets. He aims the gun right at his father's chest in a desperate attempt to make his mother see what he sees. An attempt to convince her that his dad is special, that his dad is a superhero, so that she won't divorce him. Bruce Willis tries and fails to convince his son that if he pulls that trigger, he will in fact die, but to no avail. So instead he feigns anger. Two things will happen if you pull that trigger, he says. Number one, you're right, the bullet will just bounce off of me. But number two, I'll pack my bags, walk out of that door, and neither you nor your mother will ever see me again. Because I thought we were just about to become friends. Prompting his son to finally put the gun down. For in the mind of this child, the prospects of his parents not loving each other like they used to is a far more terrifying threat than a bullet from a gun. Yeah, okay, I guess that's pretty good, but these scenes are both from his early movies. We've already established that he started out good and then got bad, so it's not like old, released in 2021, the scene where the character Maddox has aged from 5 to 16 years old in a matter of only a couple of hours, and in an attempt to describe her rapidly changing perception of the world, she says that my thoughts have more colors in them now. Yesterday I had a few colors and they were really strong. Now I have more but they're quieter. Possibly the most well-crafted and accurately put together analogy for the difference between being a child and being an adult that I have ever heard. For while I stand here reading this script, I can tell you that I see this room in so many more colors than I did 20 years ago, but none of them are as vibrant as I remember them. So it's kind of strange, right? How this untalented storyteller with such a lack of understanding of the human experience has all of these little moments of like raw brilliance sprinkled in throughout all of his movies. And yes, I mean all of his movies. It's so strange, in fact, that the only way that these scenes could make any sense at all would be if M. Night Shyamalan is in fact not a bad director, not a bad writer, not a bad storyteller lacking basic understanding of the human experience. No, and this is the part in the video where you should realize that you've come to the M. Night Shyamalan twist because you better believe I was lying through my teeth when I was telling you that M. Night hasn't made any good movies or done anything worth watching after science. Because I genuinely think that behind the flaws, behind the sometimes goofy dialogue, behind Mark Wahlberg making this face for 90 minutes, is a supremely capable and talented storyteller, and in fact, possibly my favorite director of all time. A director whose movies rarely, if ever, fail to be entertaining, be it intentional or not, and a director whose writing, while at times hard to translate to the screen, it can't be real comes from a place of absolute understanding of the human condition. Now hold on to your oysters. I'm aware that uh, it would be a bad idea for me to uh, try and sell you on the idea that everything M. Night has ever done is secretly genius, so uh, I'm not gonna do that. But I do mean that he is genuinely uh, my favorite director, probably. 
but I hear you. What about Kremlin Darandino, Res Manterson, Stormy Cubic? And I hear what you're saying. Those are good directors, some of the best, in fact, but you've seen their films. You've seen a 50-something-year-old Quentin Tarantino try to remake his first film Reservoir Dogs, but this time it's in the Wild West. You've seen Wes Anderson make yet another movie about people walking around, talking quickly and being symmetrically bad father figures. You've sat through 2001, A Space Odyssey and went, Yeah, it really is a masterpiece, huh? What the fuck is happening in this movie? I don't get it. And that's to be expected from any artist. No one is 100% on the money every time. It's hit and miss, which naturally leads me to Mr. Knight over here. No, these are not all masterpieces, but they're all fun. As long as written and directed by M. Night Shyamalan is written in big bold letters at the start of a movie, I know that while I might not love it, I'm gonna be walking out of there entertained. And I don't know about you, but that's kind of why I watch movies, to be entertained. But now you might be thinking that one could argue that uh, a lot of entertainment out there doesn't take a lot of skill to make. And that's true, you don't need to be a good writer to create entertainment. What? What? What's, what's up? Why are you looking at me like that? The joke is that I'm not a very good writer, but I have so many thoughts in here and I need to let them out somehow, lest they kill me. But when it comes to M. Night Shyamalan, there is not only entertainment, there is also somewhere in each and every single one of his films a specific line of dialogue, a character interaction, or some other moment of brilliant writing. And that's what we're gonna be looking into in this video. I watched every single M. Night Shyamalan movie, yes, all of them, in a quest to find at least one example of good, nay, great, nay, brilliant writing in each and every one of them. Am I doing this to convince you that he's a great director? No. Am I doing this to prove a point that he's not all bad? Yes, y yeah. Mm -hmm. But am I also doing this because I wanted an excuse to watch every single M. Night Shyamalan film? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yes. Yes. That, that, that's why I did it. Let's begin. Spoiler alert. In this video, I'm gonna be spoiling each and every M. Night Shyamalan movie. I'm gonna go into the plot and then I'm gonna pick out the little moments that stick out to me. So if there's any specific M. Night movie that you don't wanna have spoiled for you, you can use the chapters down below. Remember before when I kinda alluded to the fact that The Sixth Sense isn't actually M. Night's first movie? At least what people consider to be his first film. That's because Praying With Anger is actually M. Night's first movie. The reason this one isn't talked about as much is because it never got like a proper release. It mostly made the rounds through various film festivals and I think won some prizes actually. Luckily for me, however, there is a VHS rip available on YouTube. Don't ask me how, uh, but that's what I watched and that's what I'll be using to play in the background of this segment. But yeah, Praying With Anger. Uh, M. Night funded this movie himself with the help of his parents, I think, and he wrote, directed, produced and stars in this one. So let's get to it. This is our main character, I'm just gonna call him Knight to keep it simple. Knight is an English major from America who's gone to India for like six months or something uh, as an exchange student on his mother's insistence to like get in touch with his roots or something. This is basically like a fish out of water kind of drama film. So it's not really the type of film that we've come to associate with Shyamalan uh, in later years, but uh, the very heavy handed themes of religion that kind of permeates his entire filmography is here already. The movie has some more or less standard plot beats. M. Night is known to be a bit of a fighter, uh, but he's actually not a fighter. He just can't stand injustice and he had to put his foot down when a bully pushed him uh, in his American school. So now people think that he's like this bad kid, even though he's actually very nice. Here in India, he's living with some family and the son of that family becomes kind of like his best friend slash brother. He has a crush on some girl that he can't have due to cultural reasons and there's a group of bullies who bully him also for cultural reasons and he isn't really doing that great in school here also for cultural reasons because he's from another country and everything's different here there's this one scene in a temple where knight is talking to his friend about faith and while this isn't the good scene in this movie i do like the little exchange they have here where knight's friend says that it doesn't matter who you're praying to as long as you're praying 
I don't know, I'm not a religious person, I just thought that was nice. The movie's pretty all over the place, but from here on out, let me just kinda summarize the plot in list form. So, Knight witnesses a sort of exorcism, I think, and the shaman lady says that Knight has a pure soul. The bullies slap Knight around, kick him a little bit, and then they force him to drink alcohol and walk through traffic. We learn that Knight's father has passed away and that Knight thinks that his father didn't really love him or at least was ashamed of him. Knight goes to the village where his father grew up, where he learns that his father did in fact love him because he's been like sending letters back there telling them about how proud he is of his son. Knight and his friend get casually robbed. Jay, who are these guys? My first guess would be that they are criminals. Oh God. So they have to clean fish for a few hours to pay for a bus ticket back home. Before that though, Knight plays American football with some kids. And then there's a scene where maybe it's just like the VHS quality uh, or the fact that I watched this on a train uh, or the fact that I'm just immature, but in this scene, M. Knight sees a shadow of his dad, kind of like a ghost, I guess. And then I guess it kind of like fuses with him or something, uh, or maybe it's just like walking out of the room, uh, but to me, it, it doesn't look like that's what's happening. So I kind of think it looks like his dad is, is giving him the old sloppy toppy. One way ticket to throat town. <laughs> Jesus. A savory slobbering. A prime blowjob. It looks like his dad's uh, shadow ghost is kind of sucking his dick. That's it. Okay, I'm over it. Move on. Knight is about to go back to America soon, so he decides to first confess his love to his crush, but before he can do that, there's like a riot gathering outside of his house. And I'm not gonna lie, I think the VHS quality and the fact that I was on a train made it a little hard for me to understand exactly why they're out here, uh, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, the bullies show up on like motorcycles, but all of the bully goons think that the bully leader is going too far, so they take Take off, leaving him alone. After this, the bully leader takes someone hostage and forces M. Knight to kind of do a salute, uh, or else he's gonna hurt the guy, I guess. They've been trying to get M. Knight to do a salute throughout the whole movie, that's like a bullying technique, I guess. And so M. Knight does the salute, but then afterwards he kicks the guy to the fucking curb and beats the shit out of him. And while he does, you can hear people in the crowd kind of go... <laughs> Which is like, whoa, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> but Knight doesn't kill him, instead he kind of just gets up and starts walking away. But then the crowd, I guess they're all riled up, they bring out gasoline and they start pouring it on the bully. Uh, so I guess they really meant it when they said kill him before. But Knight comes back, grabs the gasoline and kind of throws it all over the place and on the crowd. So now they can't light the bully on fire without lighting themselves on fire as well. The next day, Knight runs into the bully in school and the bully uh, salutes him and he salutes back. So I guess they're uh, good friends now or something. Knight then goes to talk to the girl that he has a crush on. He finds out that their relationship won't work. Then he has a bit of a realization about faith, I guess. And then the movie ends. Okay, for this one, I'm gonna do it a little bit differently than how I'm gonna do it with the other ones, because this is essentially not an official M. Night movie. This is kind of like a film school project, except it's, you know, not from film school, but it's essentially the same thing. And it feels a little unfair to compare it to the rest of his work, where there was actually, you know, a budget and producers and stuff. So instead of pointing out one really good scene, I'm gonna point out a few kinda good scenes. Consider them embryos of what's to come. So the first scene, the principal thinks that M. Knight must be cheating to get as good grades as he's getting. M. Knight isn't actually cheating. Back home in America, he's an English major with a special interest in Shakespeare. So the guy's not only looks, he's got the brains as well. The principal says that he's gonna keep a close eye on Knight to catch him cheating, and in a later scene when he's literally spying on Knight while he's taking a test, uh, Knight, without like looking up, holds up this note that, that says, I see you. And I think it's funny in this kind of pretentious young writer way, kind of like, how do you like them apples from Goodwill Hunting? It's that sort of thing. For the second scene, it's this one that I love when Knight douses the angry mob in gasoline. Again, I think the writing is a little bit like, 
edgy young rider stuff. Like, why the fuck would you light the match if you've doused yourself and everyone else in gasoline just to prove a point? Don't light the match. You could kill everyone. But the whole religious themes of the film where night kind of represents the atheist viewpoint and uh, the Indian people around him represent uh, faith. There's something at least kind of profound with them essentially enacting this people's court on this guy about to kill him out in the street and then M. Night grabbing gasoline and throwing it on them saying you want to play God? Go home. And finally, for scene number three, uh, there's a scene at the end where he talks to the girl he likes, and like I said, she likes him back, but their relationship won't work, and that's because she's already engaged uh, to a man that she's never met with, you know, there's like an arranged marriage and all that. And from my perspective, which, mind you, is not a very educated one, especially on this topic, uh, I thought that this scene dealt with that whole thing uh, pretty respectfully and believably. It's not too much white knighting, savior complex kind of thing, while still kind of, you know, questioning the idea and saying that, you know, she can do whatever she wants with her life. And yeah, I th thought it works. But that's all for Praying With Anger. Now it's time for Wide Awake. This one's also hella weird and it's very different from the sort of movies that we associate M. Night with today. Wide Awake is essentially a family film. It's like a drama comedy about this kid finding God. And I'm not gonna lie, uh, not my type of movie at all. Not really why I wanted to make a video about M. Night Shyamalan. Uh, so I'm just gonna try to race through the plot of this one. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanna say that while I really thought I was gonna hate this movie, I actually really didn't. It's fine. Sometimes it's even good. It's just not my cup of tea, you know? M. Night has this tendency throughout his entire filmography to write a lot of like wildly unbelievable dialogue from kids, but in this specific movie I actually think it works pretty damn well. It reminds me of Clerks, like in Clerks most characters speak in this same sort of way, uh, but it's not a problem because you kind of accept it because you accept the universe of the movie, if that makes sense. And the same goes for this. The kids talk to each other as if they were like 25 and not, I don't know, eight, but it works. It's, it's, it's decently funny, but okay, plot wise. This kid goes to Catholic school, but he doesn't believe in God. However, one day he decides that he does believe in God. So now he's on a mission to find God. The kid's grandpa is dead, which affected him deeply. They were very close. And grandpa always said to never lose faith. Throughout the film, we get introduced to a wacky cast of characters like the bully, the fat kid, the weird kid, the best friend, and the mysterious little blonde kid that shows up every now and then and just says nothing. Uh, and all of them are up to various hijinks and goo goofy mischief throughout the entire thing, but it's during the second half of the film that we get this movie's good scene. It's a flashback to when grandpa was still alive, and the kid is obviously sad about grandpa dying soon. The grandpa asks the kid to not cry, saying that he couldn't handle it, and they sit down on a bench, and they have this really nice little interaction where grandpa essentially confesses to being, quote, a little scared. scared. The kid then replies by saying that he's a little, a little scared, scared too. too. He then asks if it's, it's okay, okay to cry now, cry and they both do together. To me, it was a very touching little moment and it has a hint of what's to come and what I think is M. Night's probably biggest strength as a writer, writing believable family interactions. It's just that his family interactions work the best when they're paired with like a horror setting. But here, when it is like a family drama, the family drama writing just feels expected, I guess, and it doesn't hit as hard. Still a very good scene though. Anyway, the movie goes on and the kid finally finds God and restores his faith. And once he has, he talks to the little blonde weird kid that I mentioned before. And for the first time in the entire movie, the kid opens his mouth and he says a bunch of cryptic shit like, ooh, I've been watching you and so has he, hoo hoo. And our main kid is like, who are you talking about, M my grandpa? And the blonde kid is like, ooh, I don't know, maybe, I won't tell. <laughs> And then it disappears into thin air, and we, I guess, find out that the blonde kid was like... an angel <laughs> or something. And that's, for those of you keeping count, our first M. Night Shyamalan twist. Pretty cool. 
But with these first two movies out of the way, we're now finally moving into the M. Night Shyamalan filmography that we all know and love. Because we all love it, right? My hair is short, I'm sitting down. I guess you could call me multifaceted. But get that shit out of my face. Because it's become time for M. Night's claim to fame, Mixed Sense, AKA Bruce Williams was a goblin? If you actually haven't seen this one and you don't know what happens at the end, genuinely go watch it before continuing or uh, skip through this part of the video, please. When researching, I saw this clip of M. Night appearing at a talk show saying that he still gets pissed when people spoil the Sixth Sense, so go watch it. Nothing but respect for my precedent. Bruce Willis here is a very successful child therapist. So successful in fact that he's just won an award for being so good with the little lads and lassies. Him and his wife are in the middle of celebrating this award and then they go upstairs to have sex. But in the bathroom, connected to their bedroom, because that makes sense, America, yeah, that's a logical thing, just poop smells when you're trying to sleep, they find a crazed, half-naked lunatic. The lunatic goes on about how Bruce couldn't help him, so we can deduct that he's a former child patient, and then he shoots Bruce in the stomach and then turns the gun on himself. Cut to one year later, Bruce Willis survived the shooting, but he's a changed man. We find him sitting on a bench and he sets his sight on this specific child and starts following it, you know, like normal people do. But it turns out that this child is Bruce's newest client, or I mean, I guess the mom is technically the client, I don't think the child pays for it. But Bruce is here to help this child because he has anxiety since his parents got divorced. Uh, 90s kid much? Growing up in the 90s with your parents divorced? Check. Only 90s kids will remember the trauma of having two places to live and having to celebrate Christmas twice. So Bruce and the kid talk a little bit and they make some slight progress. Then there's a great spooky scene where the mom is in the kitchen and then leaves the kitchen and then comes back to the kitchen and now all the cabinet doors are open and it's all filmed in one take. Which reminds me a lot of one of my favorite horror movie scenes ever, that being the scene in Poltergeist where the mom is in the room, walks out of the room and then comes back in, all filmed in one take, but now all the shares are stacked on top of each other as like an upside down pyramid. It's very spooky and I bet M. Night fucking love that shit. So Bruce and the kids start having therapy sessions, talking about the kid's dad leaving and those sort of things, but they're not really making the sort of progress that they should be. Hmm. Around the same time, the kid's mom is looking at old photos and she discovers these weird glowy things in all photos of the kid. Hmm. The kid bullies his teacher by names he hasn't been called since middle school. The kid gets locked up in a hole in a wall during a birthday party, which kind of makes him have like a panic attack. So he gets taken to the hospital and in the hospital, Bruce Willis comes to visit him. Bruce tries to tell the kid a bedtime story, but he's not very good at it. And the kid gives him some feedback saying that we have to add some twists and stuff. Okay, some twists. Mm hmm really? Yeah, you think so, Mr. M. Night Shyamalan? Who would have thunk? Bruce then goes on to trauma dump on the kid, telling him about the time that he got shot a year ago. He says that it ruined his marriage and that his wife barely speaks to him anymore. And also the guy who shot me was actually a kid that I failed to help and he reminds me a lot of you, so now I'm kind of worried that I'll fail you too and then maybe you'll shoot me one day? In response to all of this, the kid says that he's finally ready to open up, and then we get one of the most famous movie lines in history. I see dead people. So if we take this kid at face value, I guess he can see ghosts, but Bruce doesn't take him at face value. He instead theorizes that it's some kind of trauma-inflicted psychosis. In fact, he's seen this exact thing once before. The kid that grew up to shoot him with a gun. We see a spooky dead lady in the house, we see people hanged in the school, and it's all very spooky. And then we have this movie's great scene, which is a scene where the kid and his mother are having dinner. His mom asks him to not move her pendant anymore. It belonged to her mother, who has passed away. The kid says that he hasn't touched the pendant, and the mother gets upset with him. They go back and forth like this for a while, but eventually his mother gets fed up with his apparent lies, and sends him to his room without finishing his dinner. The kid heads to his room, but as he does, he meets the dog. Something has scared it. We then see a kid that says that he knows where his dad hides his gun, and then he turns around and we can see that the back of his head is missing, presumably an accidental gunshot wound. The dog is now hiding in a closet, and the kid's mother, overwhelmed by emotions, is trying to coax the dog out, and then this plays out. If you're not very mad, better sleep in your bed tonight. Look at my face. 
I'm not very mad. And it's just so fucking sweet. I love it. Great scene. There's also another scene that I'm not gonna go into as much, but in the middle of the night, the kid gets up because he can hear his mother having nightmares. And when he gets closer, he can hear that the nightmare she's currently having is about her not being able to help him with whatever he's dealing with. Without waking her up, he comforts her, much in the same way that I can imagine that she has comforted him before. Watching these two scenes back to back while writing this script, I'm not gonna lie, I kinda teared up a little bit. This is exactly what I was talking about during Wide Awake. This kinda family drama writing works so well when it's written into a genre movie like this. It's just... Good soup. Anyway, Bruce's marriage is, as we've already established, falling apart. Not only does his wife not speak to him anymore, now it seems like she's cheating on him as well. But there's no time to repair this marriage, because Bruce finds old tape recordings from the sessions with the boy who shot him. And in these recordings, he finds that if he turns the volume all the way up, he can actually hear the ghosts talking to the kid. It's real. Ghosts are real. He goes to talk to the kid and he asks if the kid has ever tried to like listen to the ghosts instead of hiding and then they decide that the kid is gonna try that next time he encounters one. That evening a puking ghost girl shows up and instead of running away, just like they agreed, the kid listens to her instead. We don't get to hear what she says but in the following scene we see the kid and Bruce go to a house where they're currently holding a wake slash funeral for the puking girl. Bruce and the kid sneaks upstairs, open the world's shiniest doorknob to her room, uh, then the kid grabs a clown and the puke girl shows up to show him a box that he also grabs. The kid then gives the box to the dad of the puke girl who opens it and finds a VHS tape inside. He pops it into the VCR and on the video there is video evidence of the mother slash stepmother I guess poisoning the child. She wasn't sick, she got murdered. After ruining this wake and tearing this family apart, the kid goes outside and gives the clown to the dead girl's little sister. Now that the kid knows that he shouldn't be scared of the ghosts and instead just try to help them with whatever unfinished business they had before they died, he's happy. And so he tells his mother all about this superpower that he has and he proves it to her by telling her some stuff about her dead mother. Everyone is happy? The end. And that's the sixth sense. Now we'll be moving on. What's that? I missed something? Well, yeah, I need to leave out a bunch of stuff. This video is already so long, I can't spend 30 minutes on each movie. <laughs> so the next mo Fine, I guess I skipped a couple of things. Bruce Willis and the kid have a scene where they say goodbye to each other since the kid is, you know, fixed now and he doesn't need a therapist anymore. After this, Bruce comes home and his wife is sleeping. He sits down to talk to her a little bit, but then she drops something. It's... his wedding ring. This doesn't make any sense. Unless... I see that. What's up fam, let's talk about a movie starring Brush Winston. A baby is being born in the back room of some store or something. The doctor finally arrives, but when he does, he asks the other people in the room if something happened to the baby. Did they drop it or...? No, they didn't. Okay, that's strange because all of the bones in this baby are broken. The arms and the legs are all fucked up. This is a little, little broken baby. Title scene. Bruce Willis is on a train and suddenly he finds himself sitting next to an attractive girl, so he whoop, gets that ring off his finger. It's bruising time. I didn't make that up, he actually says that in the movie. He says, it's bruising time, let's get Willising. I can't show you the clip because like the camera, uh, the cam there's like a problem with the projector. Anyway, the girl is unfortunately not into Bruce Willis, so she moves to another seat. The train then goes full sonic mode until it derails and kills everyone on board. Or does it? Cut back to the 60s or 70s or something, and we have this kid. He doesn't like going outside to play with the other kids because he has brittle bones disease. And here comes a great scene from Unbreakable. So kid is sitting in the living room and his mom comes in. The mom says that he should go outside and play with the other kids, but the boy says no. He doesn't want to because he seems to always get hurt when he does. The mom then looks out the window and asks him, what's that down there by the playground where all the kids are? Turns out that it's a gift wrapped box. The boy says that some kid is gonna take that any minute, so the mom says that he better hurry up then. The boy goes outside, sits down and opens the package. It's one of his favorite things, a comic book. His mother then says, 
Could be one of these waiting for you every time you want to come out here. And I think this is a really sweet interaction for many reasons. But first of all, I appreciate that M. Night has this tendency to write characters that uh, are more multifaceted than what you might expect out of the gate. Because at least to me, the obvious way to write this scene, and the way that I think a lot of writers would have approached it, is that both of these characters would essentially have the opposite role that they have right now. There would be the kid wanting nothing more than to just live a normal life. He would be sitting there in the window watching the other kids playing and asking, why can I go out and play with the other kids? And then the overprotecting mother would enter the room and go, you know what happens when you do that? You'll just get hurt again. I'm sorry, but you need to stay inside with me. I can't have my wonderful little boy get hurt or something along those lines. And then she leaves the room and we see that she left him a new comic book to keep him entertained inside. But as you know, that's not what happens. Instead, we have this kid scared of getting hurt by a world he seems too fragile to live within and the mother wanting only what's best for her son, knowing that he can't sit inside by himself reading comic books his entire life. Despite this, she doesn't discourage his interest in comic books. She seems to recognize that it's a genuine and creative hobby and even encourages it by using comic books as a reward system for him to face his fears. Good writing. Moving on with the plot though, surprise, Bruce Willis survived the train crash. In fact, he is the sole survivor out of literally everyone on the train and not only did he survive, he walks out of the hospital essentially without a scratch. We find out that Bruce Willis' marriage is failing, bit of a recurring M. Night theme to have Bruce Willis be in bad marriages. We also learn that he's kinda depressed and he feels like there's something missing from his life, but he doesn't know what or why. There's a scene where Bruce Willis meets the boy from before and he's now Samuel L. Jackson. Jackson is now a comic book collector and seller. And then a bunch of stuff happens, Bruce Willis kind of finds out that he's much stronger than he thought he was. His son gets convinced that his dad is a superhero and Samuel L. Jackson is kind of half stalking him, contacting him again and again, asking him how many times he's been sick in his life. When thinking about it though, Bruce Willis realizes that he can't actually recall being sick. Like, ever. There's another beautiful scene in here that I'm not gonna linger on too long, but in short, Bruce Willis' wife suddenly knocks at the door late one night. They sleep in separate bedrooms because again, bad marriage. He opens it and she says that she has a question. She says it doesn't matter to her what he answers, but that she just needs to know. In fact, she repeats that several times before getting the question out. Eventually she does though and the question is, have you been with anyone else? He replies that he hasn't and she immediately breaks down crying. The answer did, in fact, matter a whole lot to her. She says she wants to try again. She wants to attempt to repair their broken marriage. And that's the scene, essentially. I just think it's very well written. Uh, but then there's a small thing in a following scene as well, where they go on a date to kind of rekindle their love. And at one point she asks him when he first knew that their marriage was failing. Willis then describes that he was in bed next to her and woke up from a nightmare, but it didn't wake her up so that she could tell him that everything is okay. And that's when he knew. And like, I've had this conversation almost exactly. And I know that that's very subjective and maybe you're like, I, I can't relate at all, but it still hit me like a fucking truck the first time I saw it. Another great scene. And then a bunch of more stuff happens. We have that one scene that I mentioned in the beginning where the son is about to shoot his dad. And we also learned that while Bruce has never gotten sick or basically never even gotten hurt, he did almost drown as a kid. He was apparently technically dead for a few minutes before they managed to bring him back. After this, there are no more great scenes in this movie. In fact, I think that the last third of this movie is by far the slowest and kind of least interesting one. So I'm just gonna summarize the rest of the plot real quick. Willis realizes that it is in fact strange that he is so strong and basically can't be hurt. And also, I guess he never thought about this before. It is kind of odd that he can just kind of lightly graze someone's shoulder and then for his inner eye, he can see their most evil deeds. So he can be like out walking, bump into someone and then be like, oh shit, that guy fucking murders babies. So he reaches out to Samuel L. Jackson and asks what to do about this and Samuel L. Jackson basically goes, Dude, you're a superhero. It's just like I told you. You're like the guys from my comics. Yeah, okay, but what do I do about that? Just go where people are. Do superhero shit. And so he does and he finds a bad guy. He follows the bad guy, rescues the family that the bad guy has tied up in their home and then almost dies in a pool. Cause remember how he almost drowned as a kid? Yeah, all superheroes have a weakness. 
water is his. He then kills the bad guy and takes off into the night. The next morning, he shows his kid a newspaper headline to let the son know that, yeah, you were right, I am a fucking superhero, but hey, don't tell mom. You know how she gets. Women, they don't understand superheroes. The marriage is saved and Bruce Willis' depression is gone. All is good. Bruce then goes to one of Jackson's art exhibitions to thank him, but that's when he finds out that Jackson was in fact the person who made his train derail. And in fact, Jackson is responsible for many other such accidents where many people have died. And all of this in the pursuit to find someone like Willis. A polar opposite to himself and his weak bones. A real superhero. Making him a real supervillain. And uh, during this reveal, there's one shot of a bunch of newspaper clippings hanging to the wall of various accidents that Jackson has caused. And one of them says, mudslide in Mexico kills all, expect newborn. And I, for one, didn't, in fact, expect newborn. Okay, first of all, Signs is by far my favorite M. Night movie. In fact, it's one of my favorite movies of all time, period, all categories. So if you haven't seen it in a while, or at all, uh, I heavily suggest watching slash re-watching it. It just has that early 2000s charm, it's engaging, spooky, and it's fucking hilarious. We're gonna beat your ass, bitch! I'm insane with anger! And when I rewatched it like five years ago for the first time since I was like 10 or something, I was blown away by just how good it is. So uh, give it a chance slash second chance if you haven't. Also, I've already mentioned the best scene in this movie in the intro, that being the dinner scene. But for both this one and the other ones that I mentioned in the intro, I'll just dig up another couple of scenes from them because why not make this video even harder for myself? Oh, and before we start recapping, uh, you heard me joke about it in the beginning, uh, but you're probably gonna hear me refer to this movie as The Signs instead of Signs, as it's actually called, which stems from a long time obsession I've had with the song The Sign by Ace of Base, and I'm not gonna apologize for saying the title wrong or liking that song. We both know it's a good song, stop lying to yourself. Oh, and in that same vein, for both this movie and every other movie that features Joaquin Phoenix, uh, I'm gonna be referring to him as Jaquin Phoenix. You don't have to point it out, I know it's wrong, but I've always said it like that, and you can't teach this old dog to pronounce Joaquin. So, Science starts off with some hella intense opening credits, and then we find Mel Gibson. He's a single father living with his son, daughter, and younger brother, Jaquin. They live in this farmhouse, and they've just discovered crop circles in their cornfields. That's weird, but the weirdness continues as their previously healthy dog starts acting strange. Mel Gibson says that he'll call Dr. Crawford, and his son points out that Dr. Crawford isn't a veterinarian, but Mel Gibson assures him that Dr. Crawford will know what to do. A local policewoman and friend of Mel Gibson comes over to check out the crop circles. As they're out in the field, Mel realizes that he can't hear his kids anymore, so they go back to the house and they find that the dog tried to attack the daughter, so the son had to kill it. That same night, we have the first great scene of this movie, when Mel Gibson sits down with his daughter on her bed and they have this conversation. Why do you talk to mom when you're by yourself? Makes me feel better. Does she ever answer back? She never answers me either. A scene which I feel like I don't need to explain why it's so sweet and heart-wrenching, but to really get this scene across the finish line and way over it, it goes from this sweet conversation to Mel looking out of the window and seeing... <gasps> Skeleton. Mel and Jacqueline go out to scare off the intruder, but they find no one. But then they hear the person they're chasing jump up on the roof and then with inhuman speed and agility make its way back into the cornfield. The next day the cop comes back again and on TV they see that the crop circles have now turned up all over the world and Sun is convinced that aliens are attacking. Then they go into town. We learn that Jaquin is a former baseball player who specifically has a really good batting arm. We also learn that Mel Gibson is a former priest with emphasis on former. 
While out having pizza, they suddenly see M. Night Shyamalan walk by and get into his car. They all tense up. But why? Who is that? Who's this, who's, who's, who's this handsome man right here? What secrets does he hold? They get back home and Mel then goes out into the cornfield and sees something strange. When he gets back inside, they decide to turn the TV back on and yeah, aliens seem to actually be a thing. Who would have thunk? Mel's son shows him some stuff from an alien book that he bought while in town and they find this one illustration of a house that looks almost exactly like their house being attacked by a UFO. In front of the house lays the bodies of two children and one adult. Suddenly, the phone calls. Mel goes to pick it up, but the person on the other end doesn't say anything. But Mel knows that was M. Night calling. Who is he? Who is this mysterious handsome man? Mel decides to go to M. Night's house, or Ray as he's called in this movie, and we learn that Ray is a veterinarian. So if he knows a veterinarian, why wouldn't he call him when the dog was sick, but instead insisting on calling Dr. Crawford? Who is this man? Who is this? sexy handsome man. It turns out that Ray is the guy who fell asleep behind the wheel and accidentally killed Mel's wife. Mm -hmm. Awkward. Ray says that he's sorry for what happened and then he says that he thinks aliens don't like water and then he ends their conversation with don't go in my pantry I think I trapped an alien in there and then he just speeds <laughs> off. But Mel does go inside and he encounters a spooky alien hand and he cuts two fingers off of the hand. He then comes back home and decides to board up the house. In another great scene, Jacqueline and the kids are watching TV in the little nook under the stairs where they put the TV earlier in the movie uh, and this plays out. You won't let anything happen to us, right? No way. I wish you were my dad. What did you say? Don't you ever say anything like that again. Ever. Which is just so well written. I just love the dynamics of this scene and the implication it holds without really uh, explicitly going in to exactly what's happening between these characters. And then comes the dinner scene, which I described in the intro, so I won't linger on it now, but just to make sure that I recap it correctly. After boarding up the house, Mel decides that they should eat whatever they want for dinner. So they all pick their absolute favorite foods and then they sit down to eat it, but you know, they're scared of the aliens and stuff. The son suggests saying a prayer and Mel angrily proclaims that he won't be wasting another minute on prayers. And the son then says, I hate you. And Mel responds, both of the kids start crying, Mel loses his cool and he like, you know, eats their food and then he also breaks down crying and all this while managing to like not push it over the edge towards comedy but maintaining like a genuinely heartbreaking moment of a man trying to hold together his... Okay, this is what I talked about before, right? But it's, it's my favorite scene in the whole thing. As Mel breaks down crying, his son who just said that he hates him gets up and hugs him and, and Mel pulls in Jacqueline Phoenix and, and it's just uh, very nice. Anyway, after that, the aliens break in. Mel tells the kids about his memories of them being born in a way that kind of implies that he thinks they're not gonna survive the night, so he wants them to, to know how much he loves them. Then they hide in the basement and the boy is attacked and then has an asthma attack. They don't have his medicine down here. Uh -oh. Mel manages to help his son calm down to get through the worst of it and during this scene one of the most subtly profound moments go down when in between calming his son down Mel suddenly says I hate you I hate you Perhaps you understand why he says that right away. I didn't the first time, but uh, I'll circle back to it in just a little bit. The next morning, the radio says that the attacks are over. They go upstairs to give the son his asthma medicine, but before they know it, an alien that's been left behind by the other aliens attack the son. Or he doesn't really attack him, he's just kind of holding him and he's like unconscious. Also, if you look closely, this alien is missing two fingers, so you know this shit's personal. Now, earlier in the film, we learned that before the mom of the family died, her last words were, See and swing away, Meryl. Meryl is Jacqueline Phoenix, by the way. That's his, his name in the movie. Mel explains this as random synapses in her brain just desperately going off as her brain finally shut down. But in this moment of seeing his son in danger, he hears those words being repeated back to him as he sees the bat on the wall and his brother Meryl. Swing away, Meryl. 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 
Meryl grabs the bat and they go to attack the alien, but before they can do that, it manages to spray its deadly space gas uh, into the boy, but then they grab the boy, and then they realize that M. Night was right. Who would have thought the director was right? The aliens don't like water. So as Jacqueline keeps fighting the alien, Mel runs outside with his son, attempting to give him his medicine, but he won't wake up. Jacqueline then comes out, the daughter is also there, everyone's crying because, you know, the, the boy is dead. Mel looks out into nothing and says, Don't. Don't. Before suddenly dead? hearing his son's voice as he wakes up. He isn't dead. In fact, his asthma kept the deadly gas from entering into his lungs. Happy ending, cut to the future, Mel is now a priest again, the end. Okay, obviously Mel is a former priest and he's lost his wife in a tragic accident and following that he also lost his faith in God. It's a seemingly pretty classic case of, you know, how could I believe in a God that lets things like this happen, right? Then during the dinner scene, the mere mention of saying a prayer makes him really angry, but why? Again, I'm not religious, but if someone were to ask me to say a prayer, I wouldn't get angry, I would probably just be confused and uh, probably pretty awkward, but not angry. But Mel does get angry, and I think that this is because he hasn't actually lost his faith. Mel doesn't believe that there's no God, and that's made even clearer back in the basement. I hate you. And this one line right here is such an interesting angle for me. Hating God implies an explicit belief that there is, in fact, a God. For how could you hate something that doesn't exist, right? And it took Mel all the way until now to express that. And I can't help but wonder if he himself in this moment realized that. And then of course by the end of the movie on the lawn as his son is dying, he again says not to his son, not to anyone around him, but directly to God. Don't. And I don't care what anyone says, that's good writing. You could argue that it's not super subtle, but I think it has depth and it's good. And if you don't agree with me, you're just objectively wrong. You're just a little, you little dumb, dumb, poopy, poopy head brain. Anyway, I love science. I love this movie for so many more reasons than what I've mentioned now. Uh, and if you're gonna be watching one M. Night movie after watching this video, have it be science. And that's it for this one. The Village is about a village in the 1800s or so, I guess. In this village, dead animals are turning up, but that's not all that's weird. We quickly learn that the village has a sort of parameter surrounding it that you shouldn't cross, and they have uh, watchtowers and guards. But why are they doing this? Well, because of the ones we do not speak of. The ones that we do not speak of live out in the forest, and the ones that we do not speak of, which I'm from now on just gonna call monsters, look like this. They roam the forest, love the color red and hate the color yellow, and that's about everything we know right now. Okay, so Jacqueline right here wants to go through the forbidden forest and into the town to get medicine, because Jacqueline is all shook up over a child that died a few days prior from some illness or something. I'm not sure they don't really go into it that much. But the elders who kind of run the village say no. Unbeknownst to them though, at one point Jacqueline does cross the perimeter just a little bit out into the forest, but uh, not much happens. However, the monsters have now for some reason started coming into the town, breaking the truce that the village has had with the monsters for a very long time. Now the monsters shouldn't be coming into town unless someone from the town has been out into the forest. Mm -hmm. Naturally, Jacqueline assumes that this must be his fault for crossing the perimeter, so during a town hall meeting he confesses to everyone to what he has done through a note. And here already comes probably my favorite scene in the village, uh, but it kind of goes together with another scene that comes later. Uh, so this one is kind of like a two-parter that forms one thing, like when you have two good things and together they become one great thing. I don't have an analogy for it. It's, it's, it's like when you have two bionicles and you pull them apart and then put them back together to form one bigger, even cooler bionicle. And oh my god, what have we done? What have we created? Why would we spite God like this? We were so preoccupied with whether or not we could, we didn't stop to think whether or not we should. Oh god. So the first half of the good scene happens when they read Jacqueline's letter confessing to crossing the boundary in front of the whole town. And Jacqueline sits there at the back of the church or whatever it is, teary-eyed, ready to accept his punishment. The leader of the elders walks up to him and says you are fearless in a way that i shall never know 
A line that at face value might be read as just like Damn, you're brave as hell for going into that forest. That forest scary, it's got monsters in it. But obviously it's actually about how Jacqueline decided to fess up uh, to his mistake in front of everyone, despite knowing that in the culture of this village, this might like bring shame on him and his mother who he lives with. Okay, let's continue. The monsters start attacking the town even more, uh, and I've skipped over a whole bunch of story and characters, so let me just briefly introduce two that are gonna become important. This guy, the leader of the elders, has a daughter, this girl, who is blind and in love with Jacqueline. And I'm gonna call her Ginger Girl. Just Ginger for short. Ginger is also sort of like a caretaker of this guy who is mentally challenged, we'll call him Adrian Brody. Now, Ginger Girl and Jacqueline finally confess their love for each other and due to everything being like the olden days, uh, that means that they're gonna now get married very soon. The next day, after all of this has been made public, Adrian Brody knocks on the door of Jacqueline and Jacqueline invites him in. Brody is crying and Jacqueline asks if this is because of him and Ginger Girl. Jacqueline then assures Brody that Ginger still loves him too, but Brody won't have it and he shanks him a little bit. Or I, I mean he stabs him with a knife and he kind of dies. I mean, he doesn't actually die, but almost. Ginger Girl now asks the elders to give her permission to go into the town to get medicine for her husband-to-be, but again, they don't allow it. However, if you remember her dad, the leader of the elders, he kind of takes her aside and goes, hey, promise me to not be scared, but I'm gonna show you something super spooky now. Uh, and she goes like, yeah, okay, dad, I trust you, show me the spooky. He takes her to this shed, and inside of the shed is G -g -g ghost. Except not a ghost, because it's a monster, but it's not a monster either, it's an M. Night Shyamalan twist, because as it turns out, there are no monsters. It's just the elders dressing up in these suits based on like old folklore, and then they go around scaring the citizens of the town for some reason. Anyway, her father gives her some money and then explains how to get to the town and sends her on her merry blind way to get medicine for her dying husband-to-be. And then here comes the second part of the good scene. Remember the bionicle thing? The dad goes back to the other elders and confesses to them what he's done in letting his daughter get away from the town to get medicine. They're all pissed off at him, but he then stands up in front of all of them and says that he's not about to let Jacqueline die based on some lie. And then he also says that he thinks that they should just confess to the entire time that they've been lying about these monsters. And number one, this seems good. I love this guy's energy, I love his delivery. But number two, this ties in so well with that scene from before because we now understand that when he said that Jacqueline was, quote, fearless, fearless in a way in a I shall never I know, shall never end know. quote. He really meant it literally because he couldn't see himself confessing to the entire village his own wrongdoings. But it turns out that he was wrong because now here he is ready to do just that to save Jacqueline who is on his deathbed pretty much and it's just spaghetti. <laughs> you can't just say spaghetti, right? It needs to be like spicy meatball or some shit. You can't just say spaghetti as that's not like an expression. I'm gonna keep that in. Anyway, to make a long story short, and I really mean that, this movie feels like it ends like four times before it actually ends. Ginger goes into the woods. She knows that the monsters aren't real, but old habits die hard, so she's still a bit spooked. And then we see that, oh no, she's standing in the field of the monster color, but oh no times two, what's that? It's a monster. Plot twist again. The elders did base the monsters on the old folklore that her dad read. It wasn't lore. It wasn't a fairy tale. The monsters are real. They're real. The monsters chase her through the woods, but she manages to trick it and it falls into a hole where it dies and, uh, yeah, it's a third plot twist. There are no monsters. It's just Adrian Brody. <laughs> Turns out that Adrian Brody had like found his parents' monster suit and he'd been going around killing animals and scaring people with it. Yeah, real goofballs. But now that Adrian Brody is dead, Ginger keeps walking until she gets to a paved road. Yeah, you better believe we put another fucking plot twist in here. What do you think this is, amateur hour? Yeah, so turns out it's not the 1800s, it's modern day. Anyway, Ginger meets up with like a park ranger, he gets her the medicine, he gets it back to Jacqueline, he survives. The end. Also, this guy's name is Finton Coin. Finton Coin, such a fucking good name. Lady in the water, more like lady go to the polls and vote for crooked Hillary. 
Am I actually not wearing my glasses? What the fuck? I was like, why can't I see what the teleprompter says? Lady in the Water is wild uh, for several reasons that I'm gonna tell you all about. First of all, it feels kind of like a fairy tale. Uh, and that's because the story is actually based on a fairy tale that M. Night made up to read to his children at night. Uh, and that's pretty dope. But I also think this one feels especially wild because the village wasn't necessarily received all that favorably. And I think this really bothered M. Night, which he then channeled into making this movie. Which resulted in a lot of like meta elements, which I'll point out as we go along. And in fact, the movie starts off with one right away. So the main character of this one is this guy, Cleveland. He's kind of like a building manager of this apartment complex where a bunch of wacky characters live. The first scene of the movie starts off with him killing some kind of cockroach or something. And in the other M. Night movies from before, we've seen that he has a tendency to use these really long shots with no cuts. Which, by the way, Steven Spielberg used a lot. So this is like another one of those Spielberg comparison points. And if you remember, M. Night was called the next Steven Spielberg early on. And he's also said that he likes Spielberg a lot. And personally, I think oners can be really effective when used right. And they really work to like build tension. And also they show that the director has a sort of courage to stay on a shot without cutting away, letting the action play out and letting the audience wait for whatever the payoff might be. But I'm guessing that some of the movie critics of the time weren't fans of M. Night's Wonners. Because while Cleveland is killing this bug, in a pretty long Wonner, uh, Cleveland says this. Sorry, this is taking so long! Which I don't think is a coincidence and will tie into other stuff later on, but we'll get to it. So. A new person moves into the building. He's this pretentious looking douchebag who we find out works as a movie critic. We also find out that someone is bathing in the pool at night and that's not allowed. One evening Cleveland goes out to catch whoever it is in the act, but he unfortunately slips and falls into the pool. He awakens in his apartment, but he isn't alone, for there is a girl with him. Oh shit, it's Ginger from the village. In this movie though, her name is Story. One weird thing about Story though, is that Cleveland usually has a pretty bad stutter, but when he's around her, his stutter goes away. Mysterious. Story lets Cleveland know that she is looking for a writer who writes important stuff. Then they also encounter like a weird wolf, but uh, I'll tell you more about the lore in just a little bit. Trust me, there's lore. So much lore. So much lore. Like in most of his movies, M. Night himself has a role, but in this one it's a little bit bigger, and also he's a writer. So naturally, Cleveland assumes that M. Night is probably this writer that writes important stuff that Story is looking for, because meta reasons. He cast himself as an important writer, I don't have to explain why that's meta. So Cleveland introduces the two of them to each other. Then Story gets attacked and scratched by this wolf that I mentioned before, and so naturally Cleveland goes into the pool and swims down inside of her little magpie nest down there uh, to get a magical mud to save her life, and Okay, I think it's time for us to maybe cover a little bit of the lore. I'm gonna try to keep it as short as I can, but that's not gonna be easy. Story is a mermaid. I mean, technically not actually a mermaid, because she isn't like half fish, but she's like a water girl creature. Essentially, she's a mermaid. Every now and then, these mermaids must wander onto land to find a vessel, which is a person that will help them meet the big eagle, which will come to pick up the mermaid. If that happens, that means that basically everything in the world is going the right way. It's pretty much the happy ending. But there are these wolves that want to kill the mermaids. However, if a mermaid manages to find their vessel, then the wolves can't kill them. So it's in the mermaid's best interest to find their vessel as soon as possible. And I mean, technically, I guess it's in everyone's best interest that they do that, because uh, if this whole eagle thing doesn't play out successfully, then, you know, no happy ending for anyone, I guess. Excuse me, my curtain fell down. But what is stopping these mermaid-hating wolves from just going, Well, I don't care that you've met your vessel. I'm gonna kill you anyway, because I'm an evil wolf and I don't care about your vessel. Om, nom, 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 nom. Well, I'll tell you what's stopping these wolves from doing that. Three monkeys. 
These monkeys live in the trees and they watch over this process to ensure that wolves don't break the rules, pretty much. Okay, with me so far? Mermaid wants to find a person. Wolf wants to kill mermaid. If mermaid finds person, wolf can't kill mermaid. And monkeys are kind of just overseers making sure that these rules are being followed. Okay, cool. Uh, with that out of the way, uh, you're now about halfway through the lore of this movie, uh, but you've deserved a little break. So let me quickly tell you about a scene that doesn't really hold much meaning for recapping purposes, but that I just can't not mention. Cleveland is outside, he's just been attacked by a wolf, and he suddenly meets the film critic who's just been to a movie. Cleveland asks how the movie was, and the film critic answers, Sucked. Oh, what a shame. Characters were walking around saying their thoughts out loud. Who does that? Which is very funny in and of itself, because, you know, it's probably a critique that M. Night has gotten several times, but it gets better. I don't know if you've noticed, but throughout pretty much all of Shyamalan's movies, there's this big theme of water. There's always water in like pivotal scenes, characters have realizations or essentially get reborn through water. He's even explicitly mentioned in interviews that water is a very powerful symbol to him that he keeps coming back to when writing. I could list scenes from movies before this one and after this one, it's in pretty much all of them. Uh, I probably put some of it behind me, but all you need to know is that essentially water is usually present at very pivotal moments in most M. Night movies. Okay, so then the movie critic goes, and a typical romance, where the couple finally tell each other they love one another in the rain. Why does everyone like to stand around and talk in the rain in movies? <laughs> to which Cleveland replies, Oh, maybe, uh, maybe it's a metaphor for uh, purification starting anew. And then the movie critic goes, No, it's not. Which again, meta shit, but also remember that last line and this interaction for later. Now back to the last pieces of the lore. So if the mermaid has already met her vessel, M. Night over here, then why did she still get attacked by the wolf before? Well, that's because, as it turns out, there's just a little bit more to this. If the mermaid happens to be a queen mermaid, which only happens like once every thousands of years or so, then the wolves don't care. They will risk getting killed by the monkeys just to try and get the mermaid queen uh, cause I guess they just really hate the queen that much and really want to eat her. I don't know if the wolves actually want to eat the mermaids, they probably just want to kill them, but I like to imagine that they eat them. Oh, and by the way, the mermaid queen won't know that she's a mermaid queen, so that's fun. So, like you've probably already gathered, Story is the mermaid queen, which is why the wolf attacked her even though she has met her vessel, M. Night. Now to make this already pretty complicated lore even more complicated, the vessel should also be surrounded by a group of people, and these are meant to help the vessel get the mermaid to the eagle. These people should be a guardian, a symbolist, a guild, and a healer. So knowing all of this, Cleveland must now figure out who is gonna fill each of these roles. But how will he know who is who? How will he figure this out? If only there were some sort of expert around that is a professional at knowing story tropes and character arcs, the movie critic. Yeah, that's the job of a movie critic, to be able to understand a story, understand the characters. He's the perfect friend to have to help you figure out this whole mess. So Cleveland goes to the critic who gives him some thoughts on what kind of people to look for for each of these roles. So he does that and figures out who is the guardian, who is the symbolist, who is the guild, and who is the healer. Together they devise a plan on how to get this eagle to come and get the mermaid without the wolves killing her first. The plan involves throwing a big party with a bunch of people around, so they do this, and it doesn't work. Story gets attacked by the wolf again. Everyone realizes that their plan is failing, but they can't understand why. They have everyone gathered, and then the best dialogue in the whole movie happens. Cleveland says that these must be the right people for the task. He even asked an expert, but this guy questions how we can be so sure that this expert knows what he's talking about. What kind of person would be so arrogant to presume to know the intention of another human being? Who has put this young girl's life in jeopardy? Now, who do we know like that? Who do we know that assumes the intentions of other people, assumes they know how things work and why? No, 
It's not. And honestly, M. Night, fucking go off, King. Slay, or whatever the Twitter kids say. Slay Queen King. The movie critic meets the wolf and he starts predicting how the scene is gonna play out. It is precisely the moment where the mutation or beast will attempt to kill an unlikable side character. But in stories where there has been no prior cursing, nudity, killing, or death, such as in a family film, the unlikable character will narrowly escape his... But he gets it all wrong and, and he dies. <laughs> and so they figure out who is actually supposed to fill each of these roles to help the mermaid. And yes, maybe I did forget to record this one sentence somehow and I didn't notice it until now. But then the wolves attack and then the monkeys finally show up to save the day. And the eagle comes and takes the mermaid away. The end. Oh, and if it wasn't clear, uh, the good scenes for this one was every scene with the movie critic. There are some other really touching moments in this story, but I honestly can't go with anything else than this. It's just such a good fucking burn. M. Night is just out here mm, blocking out the haters. Gotta love it. If I'm not misremembering, I think this one had a tagline that went like, you've sensed it, you've seen the signs, now it's happening. But, but M. Night got so pissed at that that he was like, remove it. Remove the fucking tagline. And so I think they changed it to something else. People all over the world suddenly start giving in to the call of the void and offing themselves. Mark and Zoe is that one couple that you used to enjoy hanging out with but you don't anymore because their resentment for each other is so obvious and you just want to go break up. Break up. But they never do. So when everyone starts dying, they think it's like a terror attack or something, and so they get on a train to get out of town, and they do that together with Mark's best friend and Mark's best friend's daughter. However, the train never reaches its destination, and instead it stops in the middle of nowhere in some random town. Best friend decides that he needs to go and find his wife, and then he'll meet back up with Mark and Zoe, so he leaves his kid with them. Mmm, how fun for her. She probably loves hanging out with them. What child wouldn't love hanging out with them? They hitch a ride with this guy and his wife, who can take them to wherever they're going, uh, but first they need to stop by their place to pick some stuff up. At this guy's place, he has a big greenhouse, because he's like a florist, is that the word? He's a flower guy. And as they're standing in this greenhouse, just looking at the plants, uh, the guy comes in there and delivers this film's Second funniest piece of dialogue. We're packing hot dogs for the road. You know, hot dogs get a bad rap. They got a cool shape, they got protein. You like hot dogs, right? And honestly, I agree. Hot dogs do get a bad rep. And also to be clear, this has nothing to do with anything and it never gets brought up again. It's just a little thing that this guy was thinking about in that moment. And yes, it's pretty goofy. Yes, it's pretty funny. But also, honestly, pretty good writing. It doesn't really hold any relevancy, but not everything people say does. Not everything people say moves the plot forwards. Sometimes you just have a thought about hot dogs, and I think that's neat. Anyway, he also says that he thinks that it's the plants that are making people kill themselves. We then cut to the best friend character. He's in a car with some strangers on his quest to find his wife, and then they all kill themselves just like everyone else. And that's the end of his storyline. Rest in peace. Mark Ruffalo? Was that Mark Ruffalo? Or am I misremembering? I've seen so many M. Night movies. Isn't that Mark Ruffalo? Or is it just a guy who looks a lot like Mark Ruffalo? Either way, rest in peace Mark Ruffalo. Back to Mark and Zoe. They keep driving down the road and they get to uh, an intersection, a crossroads, like where the roads meet. And there they meet a bunch of other people and they realize that people are dying in every direction. There's nowhere to go and they decide to stop going on roads. There's a scene where Zoe admits to Mark that she's gone out for tiramisu with some guy from work. They didn't kiss or like do anything, but they did go out for tiramisu once. And now she really regrets it. And in case they die, she wants to confess to Mark that she went to get tiramisu with a guy from work, so she does. She tells him that she in fact did go and get tiramisu with a guy from work. 
tiramisu. Mark is disappointed with her, but he doesn't really say much about this. Then people start going crazy, everyone starts running, they split off from the main group, they meet two high schoolers, they find a model home, they leave the model home, they find another home, the two high school kids get shot, and they keep running, and then... There's a scene where Mark tells Zoe a story about a girl he met at a pharmacy a while back. And this is definitely the good scene for this movie, but that comes with a little bit of explanation. Essentially, to me, this is a piece of very well-written dialogue that unfortunately gets delivered all wrong. It's hard to tell if Mark Wahlberg was just the completely wrong actor for this part, if M. Night uh, was unable to, you know, give good directions, or if it's due to production problems, maybe they were stressed when shooting this, but overall, Mark's character is so badly acted in this movie that most of the time, it's just very funny when it's not supposed to be. But if we for a moment try and look past that for this scene and really try to just hear the words beneath the acting, I really do think it holds up. So to aid with this, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to read you the dialogue without playing the scene and then we'll actually watch the scene. That way you'll get to hear the writing on hopefully a bit more, you know, neutral ground before seeing how it plays out in the movie. So to remind you of the setup here, we have a struggling couple and they think that they're going to die. So the girl admits to the boy that she has gone on a date with a co-worker behind his back. Nothing happened between them and she now regrets it. This hurts the boy and they don't talk about it for a while. But after having some time to think about it, during a calm moment, the boy breaks the silence between them and says, If we're going to die, I want you to know something. I was in the pharmacy a while ago. There was a really good looking pharmacist behind the counter. I mean really good looking. I went up and asked her where the cough syrup was. I didn't even have a cough. And I almost bought it. Like I'm talking a completely superfluous bottle of cough syrup. And that's like six bucks. She has tears in her eyes. Are you joking? Silence. Then he nods his head. A tear falls down her cheek. Wordlessly, she mouths, Thank you. Hopefully I at least somewhat managed to communicate what I wanted there, uh, and that's that this scene is actually kind of brilliant in how it communicates that not only does Mark forgive Zoe for, you know, going to have with a guy from work, he also acknowledges that it's completely human to sometimes doubt your relationship, especially when you both know that you've been struggling as of late. He wants her to know that he understands and that he forgives. And to really get his point across, he does this in a way that shows he isn't angry with her by ridiculing himself a little bit and making light of the situation by comparing it to a trivial incident that may or may not be true that he has experienced himself. Essentially he's saying, hey, nothing happened and yeah, we've been struggling. It could have been either of us that did that. It's no big deal. Don't worry about it. All of that out of the way, uh, let's take a quick look at how the movie did this scene. I want you to know something. I was in a pharmacy a while ago. There was a really good looking pharmacist behind the counter. Really good looking. I went up and I asked where the cough syrup was. I didn't even have a cough. And I almost bought it. And I'm talking about a completely superfluous bottle of cough syrup. She said, that's like six bucks. Are you joking? Yeah. And listen, I'm not saying that I'm a better actor than Marky Mark over here. I'm just saying that maybe the tone was a little bit off for this entire scene. Some would even say this entire film. Moving on. They come to the house of a crazy old lady and they stay there for the night. And remember how I said that the hot dog thing was the second funniest interaction in the whole movie? Here comes the funniest one to me. I hear you whispering. 
Planning on stealing something? No, ma'am, we're not. Plan on murdering me in my sleep? What? No! <laughs> I don't have it in front of me, sitting here, but I can still see it so clearly in my mind's eye. Planning on killing me in my sleep? No, ma'am, we're not! It's just very good. I remember seeing this with a friend back in like 2015. We were fucking crying. <laughs> No, ma'am, we're not. Plan on murdering me in my sleep. What? No. <laughs> in general, I highly recommend watching specifically The Happening with a good friend. I promise you won't regret it. After this, the lady gets taken by the flower power and she offs herself. Mark is inside the house and Zoe and semi-daughter are out in a little house in the yard. They talk to each other through a pipe in the walls. This seems to be the end of the line and Mark decides that if they're gonna die, he wants to die together with them. So he goes outside where the flower power force will probably kill him but it doesn't because now this whole event whatever it is uh, isn't happening anymore like the title of the film happening three months later their now adopted daughter is starting school and zoe is pregnant an expert on tv says that he thinks that this whole event was just a warning and that it'll probably happen again and then we cut to france where it is happening again the end. Okay, so in 2010, M. Night directed... The fuck? I don't... Why does my script just say... Data expunged? What is this? I I swear he made a movie in 2010. No, I know he did. Why, why, why can't I... Oh. A fucking huge ass bug just flew into me. Did I, did I catch that on camera? That was not like a f acted thing. Wait. There he is. What the fuck is that? Yo, what's up? It's me. I'm, I'm a little bug or I'm a little insect guy. I come, I come flying from the sky or from outside to let you know that to remind you to go to the Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash jeffyot or I will get all of my fucking friends and we'll come fly in but and we will come and buzz in your ear when you're trying to sleep and you don't want that. You got a dollar. I know you do. I've, se I've, se I've seen your dollar. Give it to Jeff on the Patreon or else. You, you've been warned. Now I'm gonna go and spread a deadly disease instead. Here I go. Oh boy, this is probably gonna be the shortest recap of this entire video. At some point in the future, Earth got bad, so people moved into space and onto some new planet. On this new planet, there are aliens that can smell fear. The only way to fight these aliens is to not be scared of them. Hence, a special kind of super soldier that feels no fear must be trained. And Will Smith is such a soldier. In fact, he's like the leader corporal type guy of all these Ooga booga, no emotion, no feeling, only man stuff soldiers. Jaden Smith, Will Smith's son, on the other hand, is nothing like his father. Instead, he's an emotional baby boy who just failed his finals to become a fearless warrior like his dad. Will is obviously this absent and emotionally unavailable father figure, but on the insistence of his wife... Okay, so, uh, yeah, uh, Will is gonna go on one last big mission before retiring. Let's hope it goes well. So, on the insistency of his... Keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth! So on the insistency of Jaden Smith's mom, he takes Jaden with him on this last mission. <laughs> so they go on board the spaceship, they have one of these fear-smelling aliens, but then, oh no, they crash on some weird planet, which just turns out to be Earth. Good old Earth. 
They need to signal for help, but they can't unless they get to the other half of the spaceship. But Will Smith's legs are both broken, so instead, Jaden, little pussy boy Jaden, has to do it. Baby boy. But he does go to get this emergency beacon thing, and during the whole thing, Will Smith can like talk to him through a walkie-talkie and a webcam. And a bunch of stuff happens that neither you nor me nor anyone else cares about. And I actually, not gonna lie, had a really hard time finding anything worth mentioning in this movie. But that's okay, because technically M. Night only co-wrote this movie, so it's not a true M. Night movie. But on the other hand, I kind of would feel like I'm cheating if I don't cover every single one of his movies. So if I had to pick one scene, it's probably this one, where Jaden Smith is bit by some creepy crawly thing, and he starts swelling up and he needs to inject himself with some sort of antidote. But the swelling is making him blind, so uh, Will has to like guide him through the procedure, and he manages to inject himself with it, uh, but he's also like paralyzed for a few hours, just laying on the ground, and Will just has to sit and look at, you know, his teenaged son through a webcam as he's like paralyzed on the ground of this strange planet and he can't go there and help him. And then he needs to wake him up because it's getting cold and Jaden's gonna freeze to death. So he kind of gently wakes him saying that, hey buddy, you need to go. And they have this cute little interaction where Jaden goes. Hey dad, that sucked. And Will goes. That is correct. And that's honestly all I can do for this movie. But again, this isn't actually an M. Night movie. Like, he said himself that both this and... What the fuck? Uh, from 2010 were, like, experiments. Where M. Night wanted to see how it would work to kind of scale up his productions into full-fledged uh, Hollywood affairs. With big budgets, A-list actors, and effects companies, and all that. And he's even said himself that he didn't like the result of these experiments, and that he won't be doing that anymore. But back to the plot. Jaden goes through the jungle, fights some animals, flies for a little bit, fights a monster, sends the distress signal, and they make it out alive, everyone is happy. The end. Glad to have that out of the way, now let's move the fuck on to The Visit. Which is an interesting film. Yeah, that's how we'll put it. Interesting. This movie is M. Night dipping his sexy little toes into the found footage waters. And if you know me or anything about me, you might be aware that I have a pretty big soft spot for found footage. Several of my favorite films are found footage and I've played around in the genre myself. So it pretty much goes without saying that when I first heard of this, I was pretty stoked. So let's get into it. These two kids have never met their grandparents because their mother had a falling out with them. Despite this, she doesn't want her kids to grow up without grandparents, so now, for the first time, they're gonna go meet them and then stay at their place for a week. This is all without the mom, though. She's going on a sexy cruise with her new sexy boyfriend. And ooh! Hey, I guess I do have to introduce you to the main characters of this film, huh? This girl and this boy, whom I'm just gonna refer to as sister and brother. Sister is older and she wants to be a filmmaker, hence why all of this is being filmed. And that's like her one personality trait. And then there's brother, who also has a creative interest and it fucking sucks. <laughs> I hate it. Like, M. Night, please, I'm really, I'm, I'm really, really trying to be on your side here, but you're, you're not making it easy with this shit. It's just, yeah. So the boy is a freestyle rapper. He's kind of like a rapping equivalent of an underwhelming improv group. You give him like a word or a topic, and then he has this cringy little moment where he goes like, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 okay. Oh, yeah, I can do that, yeah. And then he just... Girl, I'm chilling again. I'm feeling again. I'm like Iron Man and Batman. I'm a hero again. Oh, you think I'm little, but last month I grew an inch and a quarter again. You think you're too good for me, but that's really a joke. Cause see, that doesn't bother me cause I'm not a sensitive bloke. Oh, now in the end, you'll be in my van. We won't be just ten. Do you like me to go your text and hit sand? We share a star, but it's just no bland, oh. And see, this isn't just philosophy based on science, you see. Mr. Singh might be the attention just in front of me. You tell sketch, I'm music. Really? Yes. How? Ooh. Ooh. 
<coughs> oh, he's done? <clears throat> okay. To be fair to the boy, though, he says it best himself. I, I got, like, no bars. None. His only other personality trait is that he obsessively washes his hands all the time because he's a germaphobe, but that won't be relevant until the end of the film, so don't worry about it. One night, sister gets up to get something from the kitchen, and she sees grandma walking around, just throwing up all over the place. The next day, she asks grandpa about this, but he's just like, Oh, yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, no, don't worry about that. That was just, that was just like a, like a food poisoning or something. She's fine. She's okay now. Brother and sister then play hide and seek in the crawl space under the house for some reason and suddenly grandma comes galloping on all fours and they get all freaked out but then she just dusts herself off and goes back to being a normal old lady. Now I don't know about you but I'm starting to feel like there's something going on with grandma over here but luckily we still have grandpa who seems calm and rational and what's that? He just attacked a random person on the sidewalk. Oh and Oh, and he's got like this shed full of his poopy diapers that he goes and hides. Yeah, that... cool. So daughter has a laptop to keep in contact with their mom, but while baking something, grandma accidentally spills some shit on specifically the laptop's webcam. So now that webcam won't work, which is, you know, super unfortunate, because now the mother can't see them when they do their Skype calls, but they can see her while she's doing all her wacky cruise ship stuff. At night, grandma keep acting weird, and eventually grandpa confesses that she is suffering from something called sundown syndrome. Sundown syndrome is a real thing, it happens to people with Alzheimer's and dementia, and it essentially means that once the sun sets, their symptoms worsen, and they get more confused and sometimes aggressive. Sister then tries to interview grandma about what happened between her and mom. And I know this might come as a shock, so hold on to your seats, but... Grandma goes a little cuckoo <laughs> when she asks about this. Grandma doesn't take it very well. So instead, sister decides to interview brother. And at first, this was gonna be my good scene for this film. But there's another one that I ended up liking more. So I went with that instead. Uh, but this is a pretty good scene. During the interview, they talk about their dad leaving. And we find out that the boy kind of thinks that it's his fault. Because once, when he was like eight or something, he froze up during a sports game. And he interprets a dad as being very disappointed with him. We learn that what he struggled with during that sports game is something that he struggles with all the time, which is that when put under too much pressure, he tends to freeze up. But that also won't really be relevant until the end, so you don't have to... You don't have to remember that. You don't have to remember any of this. The brother then turns the camera on the sister to interview her instead. And this is also one of the better dialogue scenes in the entire film. Because brother asks her a bunch of very personal questions about why she never looks at herself in the mirror. Uh, essentially saying that she's always hiding behind a camera. And we get a little glimpse into the family dynamic and the different ways that these two kids are dealing with their father leaving. Anyway, grandparents are getting increasingly unhinged, so the kids decide that maybe we should get out, but they can't. Instead, they finally manage to clean off their dirty webcam and they call their mom, asking her to pick them up. During this conversation, mom is like, so what is grandma and grandpa doing right now? And the kids are like, oh, they're just out in the yard, let us show you. So they turn their webcam towards the window and mom says, You've been staying with those people the whole time? Those aren't your grandparents. So if these are not their grandparents, who are they? Well, I'll tell you. As it turns out, they are two escaped patients from the mental facility downtown. Somehow they've broken out and they've killed the real grandparents. After this, the sister gets locked in a room with the artist formerly known as Grandma creeping around on all fours and brother ends up in the kitchen with fake Grandpa who takes one of his poopy diapers and rubs it in the face of the kid, triggering his fear of germs and making him freeze up. See, I told you it would become relevant. It all led up to the poopy face, face poop scene. <laughs> Sister manages to kill fake grandma and then comes down to the kitchen attacking fake grandpa. But he knocks her to the floor, which snaps brother out of his trance and he charges fake grandpa with a sports tackle. <laughs> he then screams sports lingo to himself. What is obviously having some kind of flashback to the sports game mentioned earlier. What is Tackles him again. <laughs> screams some more. Run! and then crushes fake grandpa's head with the fridge door. 
He then screams even more and sister tries to calm him down and as she does, right here at the very end of the movie, we get this film's great scene. And this one actually differs quite a bit from the other great scenes we've talked about so far. Because for most of these scenes I've been talking about either character interaction or dialogue. Uh, but in this one I just want to kind of praise the vibe of it. It's just the setting, the visuals and uh, most of all the music. It all goes together very well to build this sum that is greater than its parts I guess. So since this whole movie is presented in this raw filmed material with minimal cuts kind of aesthetic, it's mostly devoid of any music up until this point where the brother is freaking out and the camera is stationary on the kitchen counter and the sister is trying to calm him down and suddenly we get this great like 1950s style music track that begins playing as they make their way out of the house where they're greeted with blue lights and their mother. And it has that effect that old songs have when you put them in a setting like this where the mood of the song kind of contradicts the visuals. Tarantino plays with that a lot, like it'll be stuck in the middle with you while he cuts the ear off some guy, you know. And then the movie ends. So to recap really quickly, uh, in 2010 M. Night made... Uh, this again? something. And whatever that something was, it was very different from his earlier stuff for a multitude of reasons. Now, following that, he made another project in the same style, After Earth, which also wasn't necessarily received very well and again was very different from M. Night's older stuff. It was very obvious that M. Night was trying something new, but it was also pretty obvious that it wasn't really working out. So my theory is that after After Earth, M. Night felt a strong urge to get back to his roots and make something more low budget, more experimental, less mainstream, less Hollywood, but still not good. So therefore he went and made the found footage film The Visit. Right? So he gets that shit out of his system, he cleanses himself from all this big money grime that had accumulated all over his body ever since whatever happened in 2010. And now it's 2016. New year, new me, new year. I'm M. Night Shyamalan, I want to make something good this time, so I made... So right off the bat with Split, the first thing that sticks out is the dialogue. We finally get to go back to that classic and casual M. Night Shyamalan dialogue where every character uses two or three sentences too many every time they speak and describe everything with kind of weird references or side tangents. Jay, what health conscious fast food purveyor did you originally solicit to buy these chicken wings you've so lovingly reheated in a minor suicidal gesture? The authors of Hooters play on our incessant need for fat and man's incessant need to be in the proximity of augmented breasts. It's like Henry V ran a fast food franchise. It's a good place, Dr. Fletcher. The second thing that stands out to me when comparing this to his earlier films, and I do realize that this is not necessarily all thanks to M. Night Shyamalan, but more so maybe the cinematographer, but it's the visual quality. It has that like specific crispy look that kind of semi-independent movies had between like 2015 and 2019. It's just after everything looked super DSLR digital crisp, but right before things look however they look today. It's a bit hard to pinpoint exactly, but if you've seen Lights Out, Chappie, or especially 10 Cloverfield Lane, uh, you probably know what I'm talking about. And actually, while writing this, I realized that all those movies that I just used as examples uh, came out in 2016, uh, so maybe this isn't uh, 2015 to 2019 or whatever I said before thing. Maybe this is specifically a 2016 thing, but uh, I can feel myself getting off track and this is already a very long video, so uh, let's move on. So the movie starts off with three girls. Two of them are these kind of popular girls that seem to know each other from before, and one of them is this kind of weirdo girl that we learn got a pity invite to whatever this hangout is. I think it's like one of them's uh, birthday party. 
After the party or whatever it is, they get out and they get into the car of one of the popular girl's dad, but the dad gets knocked out and then a strange man enters their car. He then proceeds to knock the three of them out as well. Waking up, they found themselves locked in some sort of basement room. The guy comes in and drags one of the popular girls into the bathroom, but before he does that, the weird girl manages to tell her to pee herself. You see, Weird Girl is smart and she noticed that the guy obsessively removed the trash from the dashboard of the car and he also wiped his chair before sitting down, so she figures that whatever intentions he has, he probably doesn't have a piss kink. And as it turns out, she's right. He then leaves and then we get a flashback to a Weird Girl as a kid, but we'll get back to those flashbacks a little bit later. Uh, then we see that the guy is in therapy but he is looking and talking and just acting very differently. And then we learn that, aha, this guy has a few different goblins gobbling around up here. So as it turns out, this dude has DID, aka Dissociative Identity Disorder, aka the artist formerly known as Multiple Personality Disorder, aka Going Absolutely Gollum Style, aka the most relatable and common disorder to have if you're a 15-year-old using TikTok, despite it being estimated to only affect about 1.5% of the Earth's population, but hey, what do credible scientists know? You're not gonna let scientists and researchers take that away from you. Say less, science. So among this guy's personalities, we have our germaphobic friend here. We've got this fancy lady. We have a nine-year-old. We have a homosexual clothes designer and various others. And they all fight each other to be in the light, meaning the one who's in control. The girls realize this and they try to use it to their advantage, but it's not to much avail. One girl attempts to escape through a vent, but she gets caught and put in a separate room from the others. In another therapy session we learn that the germaphobe and the fancy lady have taken leader positions inside of this guy's head. But we don't quite know why and the therapist is starting to suspect that something isn't quite right. The fancy lady makes the two remaining girls sandwiches and then talks to them about the beast. They actually talk about the beast quite a bit, so I'm gonna explain exactly what that is. But first, just to get it out of the way, the other popular girl also tries to break them out and ends up being locked in a room. So okay, uh, essentially the thing about the beast is this. This therapist exclusively treats people with DID, and she claims to have seen things in these patients that science just can't explain. She's seen some personalities knowing languages that the other personalities don't. She's seen some personalities have diabetes and need insulin, while other personalities in the same person don't. She's seen a blind person whose second identity managed to develop sight. Essentially stuff that indicates that DID doesn't only affect the patient's mental states, but also their physicality. And this is taken to the extreme with the concept of the beast. The Beast is apparently the last personality of this guy, and he is described like this. This beast can crawl on walls like the best rock climbers, using the slightest friction and imperfections to hold his body close to seemingly sheer surfaces. His skin is thick and tough like the hide of a rhinoceros. He's much bigger than I am. He's tall. He's very muscular. He's got a long mane of hair his fingers are twice the length of ours. And it is also mentioned that he, quote, feasts on the impure young, unquote, but honestly, who doesn't? The weird girl manages to get a hold of a walkie-talkie by tricking the nine-year-old to let her see it, and then she speaks to someone real shortly, but she doesn't have enough time to give enough information about her situation, so not much comes of it. I could have just not recapped that part, actually, I realize right now, but uh, yeah. No, it's, it's whatever. <laughs> the therapist keeps suspecting that something fishy is going on, so she pays this guy a surprise visit. But once she arrives, she realizes that, and hold on to your oysters, this guy is actually a little bit cuckoo. But instead of leaving while she can and, you know, call the police, she goes sneaking around and then she finds the imprisoned girls and the guy knocks her out. He then leaves, goes to a train station, and inside of one of the trains, transforms into the beast. He comes back, kills the therapist, kills the two popular girls, but Weird Girl manages to escape and we have a pretty good like chase scene with some really nice horror vibes. 
Like this part where she's holding a shotgun aimed towards the vague shadow moving in the dark as it seemingly swings around the ceiling, climbing the walls, punching out light bulb after light bulb as it gets closer. And I was really tempted to just make this the good scene of the movie because I just really like how it plays out and how it looks and feels. Plus it proves that despite what the last couple of movies might have implied, M. Night really does know his shit when it comes to making horror. But no, this isn't a good scene. Could have been, but it isn't. Ooh, you better believe it's not. If you've seen Split, you can probably guess which scene is the good scene, but we'll get there. So the beast finally gets up to Weird Girl, and yeah, it was pretty much everything it was hyped up to be. He's, you know, tall, inhumanly strong, he can climb walls, he looks really spooky. As it approaches her to eat her like it did with the popular girls, it sees that the Weird Girl has these scars all over her body, and it decides to leave her be. It does this because the beast has a sort of philosophy where it considers people who haven't suffered in life impure and that people who have gone through major hardships are essentially superior beings. So instead of killing her, it runs off. And for the trauma that the weird girl has gone through that is explained in those flashbacks that I alluded to earlier. So uh, I'm gonna talk about them now. They're pretty dark, but I'm not gonna linger on it. Essentially, we've seen that when she was growing up, she was often out hunting with her dad and her uncle. Her dad, however, had a tendency to get a little bit too drunk and pass out, and then her uncle took advantage of her at a very young age. And as if that wasn't enough, eventually the dad unfortunately passed away from like a heart condition, I think, and so she ended up in the care of her uncle. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's terrible. Back to the plot though, after this the movie kind of finishes up with her being found by like a maintenance worker and then he leads her out of there. It turns out that the guy with the beast inside of him was an employee at the zoo and he had access to the old tunnels beneath it, which is where he had made his home and where he kept them captive. And as she's being led out we have all this nice symbolism of these beasts trying to get her but being, you know, unable to because of the bars. and. It it's nice. So she ends up in the back of a cop car and after a while the officer lady comes and asks her if she's ready to go back to her uncle. She hesitates for a moment and then shakes her head. The end. Ooh, you thought I forgot about the scene, didn't you? You thought, here, here's, here's what you thought. You thought, well, well, you have to you remember making a fucking two hour video about M9 with the sole purpose of like finding a good thing in each movie, and then you forgot to find something good in Split. Well, listen up, Dad. You were wrong. I, I, I do, I do finish things. I do finish things. Because after the first section of the credits roll is when the scene actually happens. Interior, diner. On the TV, a news reporter talks about this girl who manages to escape from being imprisoned by this multiple personality madman that the press has named the Horde. The kidnapper and killer is, as far as they know, still at large. The music playing in the background of this entire scene is somehow familiar. At the bar, some lady speaks to the person behind the counter and says, Is this like that crazy guy in the wheelchair that they put away 15 years ago? They gave him a funny name, too. What was it? And after saying this, we hear a voice behind her. Mr. Glass. And I don't care. I don't care what anyone says, I don't care who you are, I don't care about your philosophies, your views on the world, your outlook on life, your personal politics, your thoughts on the war, takes on Trump or religious standpoint, if you don't think that the reveal at the end of the 2016 M. Night Shyamalan film Split starring James McAvoy and Anya Taylor-Joy of it being a sequel to the year 2000 M. Night Shyamalan film Unbreakable starring Bruce Willis, Samuel L. Jackson and Spencer Treat Clark is the dopest shit ever, then you and I could never be friends in real life. And dare I say it, you and I could not even be parasocial online friends liking each other's tweets every now and then to support each other's respective creative journeys. And that would be quite a shame. He's back in the town. He's gonna kill Eva Dawn.
Don't touch mörderbruden, Eva. Om du vill leva. So with how Split ended, it's only natural that about three years later, M. Night dropped the third installment in what has been dubbed the East Rail 177 trilogy, Glass. This movie takes place about three weeks after the events of Split, and here we go. The movie begins with two teenagers sucker punching just a random guy on the street while filming it with their handycam and then fleeing the scene. Back home they're looking through the footage and one of them remarks that this will get them so many views. But suddenly they hear something in the house and one of them goes... We better salt bay your ass! And I feel like this is a great opportunity to mention that at the time of making this video, M. Night is 53 years old. And I'd say that maybe a little bit before this, but mostly starting with this movie is uh, when that age starts to be noticeable. Essentially, Glass is the beginning of M. Night's boom era. And it isn't too bad most of the time, uh, but it is pretty noticeable when he tries to depict like random teenagers and I guess like millennial slash Gen Z culture. And I think it's pretty natural that when you're in your 50s, you're not really down with the kids anymore. Glass was released in 2019 and at least as far as I remember it, there weren't really that many kids running around with handy cams and recording themselves assaulting random people in the street. And even if there were, let's say that people did do that, I don't think they would have been like celebrated online. If you went out just with a buddy uh, assaulting random people, filming it and like posting it to YouTube, first of all, it would be deleted from YouTube. I think it would have been in 2019 as well. I mean, that was post ad apocalypse. But these fucking guys would be cancelled on Twitter. They would be doxxed by 4chan. They would be clowned on by every single fucking commentary channel under the sun. It just feels a little bit out of touch. But again, this handsome old fella was born in 1970. Let's cut him a little bit of slack. Sorry about the tangent there. So they hear something in their house and one of them goes to investigate it and... Oh shit, it's Unbreakable. So he kicks their ass and when Unbreakable is done, he goes back to his lair, where we can see that his son is now working for him as kind of the equivalent of that one girl in every police show that talks to the main characters through like a wireless headset from a van and she says shit like, Ah, uh, hold on guys, I'm gonna bypass their server code base to download the PDF blueprint scripts of the building you're in. Just a second, these firewalls are doxing my mainframes and... Uh, okay, got it. There should be a ventilation shaft on your left. So essentially when Unbreakable is out doing his crime fighting, his son sits in the back room of the home security business that they now run and he kind of follows along through the earpiece by googling information he might want to know and maps and stuff. We also get a pretty fun scene here where M. Knight is in the store shopping and he notices Unbreakable and they have this little exchange. Hey, do I know you? Did you used to work at the football stadium? 15 years. I used to hang out with some shady types down at the stadium in my youth. Turned it around with positive thinking. Which I think is really fun because even though I might not have mentioned it really, uh, in Unbreakable, M. Night's cameo was as this shady guy in the football stadium, uh, but in Split, he was working as the therapist's like building manager. And since it isn't revealed until the end that uh, Split is a sequel to Unbreakable, it didn't dawn on me right away that either these two are identical twins or it's the same guy. But if it is the same guy, he's then gone from shady football stadium like drug deals to wholesome chicken wing eating security camera watching building manager. And I guess other people brought that up to M. Night, so in this movie he wanted to like clear up any confusion about this very insignificant character by clarifying that, yeah, it is the same guy. And he did do that rags to riches thing, I guess, with positive thinking. And you know what? Good for him. But then we see four shareleaders, all kidnapped by none other than Split. I guess he kidnapped them right between like the field and the changing rooms since they're all in there. <laughs> outfits. Later that day, Unbreakable is out doing one of his crime watching patrols and he bumps into Split. This prompts Unbreakable to get one of his superhero flash moments and he realizes that this guy is in fact Split and that he has the girls. <laughs> also, I'm, you probably noticed but I'm just gonna call him Unbreakable and Split in this one. I'm so tired. <laughs> 
It's too many movies for one video. Unbreakable realizes where Split has hid the girls, so he goes to save them. Split then turns into Mr. Beast, holy shit! Then he makes it back to where he keeps the girls, they escape and he instead fights Unbreakable for a while until they fall out of a window and then they get arrested by the police and also this mysterious doctor woman. They both get put in a mental institution, but not just any mental institution. This is the same mental institution that was mentioned at the end of Unbreakable, the one where they put Glass. Although today, Glass is but a shell of his former self. The hospital keeps him sedated at all times for simply being too smart. So, okay, this woman is a doctor, and she specializes in people who suffer from a very specific type of delusion where they believe that they are superheroes. Sound familiar? She sits all three of them down in a big pink Adams Family looking ass room uh, and attempts some sort of group therapy session to just therapy talk their delusions away. We then cut to Weird Girl from Split. She learns that Split has now been captured and she decides that she wants to go and see him. She goes to the hospital and when she does meet him, she says that her uncle is now in jail. As she tells him about this, for a moment, Split snaps back into his real personality. Kevin. Kevin and the weird girl has a little bit of a moment. As the weird girl is leaving, the doctor woman stops her and goes, Oh, I've never seen anything so powerful before. Your, your affections, it's, it's like a superpower. Not, not that I believe in superpowers or anything. Actually, I'm quite the opposite. I'm, I'm here to cure that sort of thing. But your loving affection is so powerful that I must ask you for your help. Please help me treat these guys. I couldn't do it without you, weird girl. That weird girl just looks at her and walks away. Back in group therapy, the doctor then tries to convince these guys that they're all just normal men. Just innocent men. And to be fair, she makes a pretty good case. For Unbreakable, she argues that he's probably just really good at like deduction and intuition. She says that these flashes he gets aren't supernatural in nature, but rather it's just him subconsciously picking up on patterns and details. And she essentially argues that that's all it is in combination with him being pretty strong. But it's not even that strong based on the scene in Unbreakable. She argues that Split does have DID, but that that's not a superpower which it isn't, and she points out that she went and investigated the bars that he bent and that they were old and rusty and that she even managed to bend them herself, although with the help of a crowbar. She also lets him know that the shotgun pellets that were used to shoot him were old and water damaged, and that when they investigated his PC, they found a lot of videos of like free climbers to the point of it obviously being an obsession for him, which could explain why he's so good at just climbing stuff. And for Glass, well, he's just a smart guy, I guess. And to be honest, I don't quite know uh, why he's here, why he is part of this. Because he's just like a really smart guy, but that also killed a bunch of people. I don't know if I feel like he needs to uh, be treated in any other way than any other mass murderer who thinks they're God, or in this case, a superhero. Nothing that extraordinary about him in comparison to the other two. But speaking of Glass, we also learned that he is actually up doing shit at night. Turns out he isn't as sedated as we've been led to believe. In actuality, he kind of secretly does whatever the fuck he wants around here. So essentially what happens after this is that Glass teams up with Split, or rather with The Beast, and Glass's plan here is to have Unbreakable and Split fight it out on the roof of this tall building, all in an attempt to show the world that superheroes do in fact exist. So to accomplish this, he also turns out the water-based security system in Unbreakable's cell and tells him exactly where and when uh, Split plans to do some bad shit on this building, so that he'll come there and they'll fight. And now I want to interrupt the story real quick with some quick thoughts. So uh, to me, as far as I'm concerned, M. Night really peaks when the concept is cool shit and also a family drama taking place in the middle of that cool shit. Early on he made Wide Awake, which had none of the cool shit but all of the family drama. Then he made Signs, which was again that perfect combination, and now he's making this, uh, which is kinda only the cool shit but not a lot of the family drama, and to me it ends up being kinda just fine. It's kinda bland, it's not bad at all, it's very entertaining, but it's also not... <laughs> Back to the plot, Weird Girl, Unbreakable Son, and Glass's mom is talking to the doctor, trying to convince her that these guys aren't crazy, uh, but then there's a distress call. 
Attention, everyone. Uh, patients have gotten out. They're escaping through the basement right now, so uh, watch out. And in the parking lot outside of the hospital, all the supers meet up. Rawr, I'm gonna beast your ass. Well then, let's get Bruce in. I'm... I'm Bruce Willis. <laughs> So Unbreakable and Beast are fighting and then Glass is just kind of there riling up Mr. Beast, edging him on. But then Unbreakable's son comes in and he's had a realization. So he says, No, Mr. Beast, listen, there's more to this. There's something Glass isn't telling you. <laughs> Kevin's dad, your dad, he disappeared on a train, didn't he? Well, that wasn't just any train. That was a train that my dad went on too. And my dad was the only survivor. Your dad died on that train, leaving you alone with your mother, and then she became abusive from the loss of her husband, and then you developed multiple personalities, and all of that is because of Glass. Glass killed your dad. As a response to this, Mr. Beast walks up to Glass and kinda crinkles him up, and then he grabs Unbreakable and throws him into a water tank. If you remember water, it's his weakness. Unbreakable is just about to die when they get out of the tank, but the Beast doesn't kill him. Instead, he says, well, We will finish this on the roof of the high building that got mentioned earlier in the movie, Mr. Breakable. Mr. Beast then tries to flee the scene, but he gets stopped by a weird girl who asks to speak to Kevin. And then, thank fucking god I was getting a little worried, uh, they have this movie's good scene. In very short, what happens is that the girl manages to coax out Kevin again, splits real personality, and she then convinces Kevin that he doesn't have to hide behind these other personalities. She tells him that if she was able to coax him out, he could do it himself, but only if he really wants to. And surprisingly, it works. We see Kevin reluctantly staying in the light. And back in Split, we did get to see this Kevin once as well. And it's hard to not feel bad for the guy, as his original personality is just this scared and confused man trapped in his own mind. But now he finds control through the tenderness of Weird Girl and maybe, just maybe, this is the beginning of him getting his life back. But then... Yeah, got him. I, sh uh, I shot the guy dead. Yeah, I, I, sh I, yeah, I got him. Rapidly switching between his personalities as he's dying in Weird Girl's lap, he eventually lands on just being Kevin and then he fully dies. Rest in peace, Split. At the same time, Mr. Breakable over here, yes, I'm gonna use that joke twice, shut up, is being picked up by someone who then starts drowning him. And we see that this someone has a tattoo on their wrist. But what does it mean? The doctor girl then comes up and asks Willis to grab her hand. And as he grabs it, we see that she too has the same tattoo. But what does it mean? <sighs> if only we could find out really soon. He touches her hand and he gets one of his superhero flashback things again. And it turns out that this woman isn't a doctor. Rather, she's part of some secret society. And then Unbreakable dies. Rip Unbreakable. Glass is laying dying on the ground, but then Dr. Girl comes up to him as well and says, Listen, Glass, before you die, I want you to know that actually, you were right. There are superheroes in this world, and there are secret organizations, just like in your comic books. And we are aware of the superheroes, but the comics, they, they got one thing wrong. We don't take sides. We get rid of all of you, good or bad, because we don't like when the world is unfair. Then she walks away, and right before Glass dies, he turns to his mother and says, <coughs> This wasn't a normal comic book, mother. This was an origin story. And then we see the secret group have a secret meeting where the girl confirms that all three of them were in fact actual superheroes but that she's taken care of it. The entire organization kind of rejoices in their deaths knowing that they can now continue to keep the fact that superheroes are real a secret from the rest of the world. Except plot twist. Old glass boy over here had an ace up his purple little sleeves this entire time. He streamed the security feeds online, so now people all over the world will get irrefutable proof that superheroes are in fact real. And he died knowing that once this get out, more superheroes will rise. Hence why he said the origin story thing. The end. <laughs> And that marks the end of the East Trail 177 trilogy, a pretty decent take on superheroes. But now get your sunscreen ready because we're going to the beach that makes you old.
This movie mostly takes place in one location and has a bunch of characters where most of them don't really matter to how the plot resolves in the end, so I expect this recap to be one of the less detailed ones. This family has just arrived at this tropical paradise where they're gonna spend their vacation. Can you believe I found this online? Y yes, honey, I, I can. That's how everyone's found their travel destination and hotels for the last like 15 years. Again, boomerang. They receive their complimentary welcome drink, there's some relationship drama that we really don't have to care about, and the son makes friends with some other kid, and then they decide to go to... The beach that makes you old? Yeah, man, the beach that makes you old. Obviously, they don't know anything about this beach, but they get tipped off that it's a nice secluded area by the boss guy from the hotel, played by none other than my boy, fellow Swede, Gustav <laughs> So they go there, and there are a few others there as well that they don't know, including a hot girl, an old lady, a doctor, various children, Miles from Lost, and a rapper called mid-sized sedan. And while I normally don't have a problem with dad jokes or jokes based solely on the fact that a word or a combination of words just sound funny, I can't help but feel that it is a little bit old man yells at clouds, right? Because I'm guessing that the joke here is that uh, if you're like in your 50s, for example, you're supposed to laugh at the younger generation for only listening to like SoundCloud mumble rappers that goes by Lil Ferrari or whatever, right? And instead of calling him Lil, he is instead mid-sized and instead of Lamborghini or whatever cars that rappers like to talk about. This guy's a sedan, which I guess is like a bad car, a boring car, an old person car. I don't know, whatever. Uh, they find a dead body in the water and they suspect that mid-sized sedan might have murdered her. Because he was the only one who was on the beach when they came there and also he apparently knew the girl. But they all realize pretty quickly that this is not the case. Instead they figure out that 30 minutes of time on this beach equals to about one year of their life. Meaning that they are all now aging rapidly while on this beach. Something that obviously is the most noticeable on children and old people. Because, you know, the kids, they, they go from infants to teenagers and uh, old people die. <laughs> they die. So obviously they decide that maybe we should go to another beach, one that doesn't make us old. So they try and leave, but they can't. Attempting it makes you pass out, collapse, lose your memory, and then you're back at the beach. That makes you old. One of the kids run off with another kid, uh, and after a little while, they come back and, uh, uh oh. I think my dog is Pregnant. Can you get pregnant? Am I pregnant? pregnant? But don't worry about it, the baby just immediately dies. Problem solved, I guess. Somewhere around here we also have the good scene that I talked about in the beginning of the video where the two kids have this exchange. I don't feel the same way I felt yesterday or this morning and I don't think my parents would understand. My thoughts have more colors in them now. Yesterday I had a few colors, they were really strong and now I have more. And they're quieter. And I've already explained why I think that's good, so let's just move on. People start dying, the doctor is either suffering from like schizophrenia or dementia, I'm not sure, but since time passes so quickly, he rapidly declines in his condition, gets paranoid and kills mid-sized sedan. Miles from Lost swims out into the water and drowns. Miles' wife dies from a seizure. The previously pregnant girl tries to climb the rocks but makes an oopsie and falls to her death. And the hot girl breaks all her bones and they heal weirdly and she now begins her new life as a sort of cave creature before dying there. And finally, the parents of the main siblings, the ones we've been following through the movie, die of old age. And it's pretty cute. And then the two children from the beginning of the movie, now middle-aged, are the only ones left. They sit next to each other on the beach. She asks if they should keep trying to find a way to escape the beach or if they should live out their remaining 13 or so hours together. He answers that they should probably keep trying to find a way out. But after a moment of silence, he turns to her and asks, You want to like sandcastle first? <laughs> and so they do. These two factual adults, but essentially children, forced to grow into bodies foreign and strange. Confused and alone, they sit, as they've been involuntarily thrown into the suffocating depths of adulthood without as much as a map, 
guide, direction or goal given. Relishing in one last moment of juvenile joy, reliving the memories of a childhood lost to time and circumstance, much like you and me. Anyway, they uh, build the sandcastle and the guy is like, Oh, I remember yesterday when I was but a wee lad and my friend over at the hotel, you know, the kid from the beginning who, by the way, is the nephew of the hotel owner who lured us here. Uh, he gave me a note with like a weird code on it. <laughs> well, it's probably not anything important. And his sister goes, hmm. No, yeah, it's probably not anything important. But you know what? Why don't we just decode it for the lols? It'll be legend, wait for it, legendary, bro. Hey, uh, shut the fuck up. So they do decode it, and... What's it say? That's not what it actually says. What it actually says is... That's not what it actually says. What it actually says is... They interpret this to mean that they actually can swim off of this beach, but not in the way that fucking idiot Miles from Lost did it. No, they need to swim through the coral. So they do. And at this point, I want to point out that this movie is actually based on a graphic novel. It's called Sandcastle, and it was written by uh, Pierre Oscar Levy and illustrated by Frederick Peters. In preparation for this video, I actually did read it, uh, and I was pretty surprised to find that it ends with them building this sandcastle. So uh, just know that from here on out, everything that happens is 100% M. Night original. So they swim through the coral. And throughout the film we've had these moments where the characters have kind of noticed that they've been watched, but they don't know for sure or if so by whom. But now we finally get to see who is watching them. M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> also, the aesthetics of this shot is just fucking wild. I don't know what's happening here. So M. Night watches them swim down under the water and he doesn't see them surface. So he goes and reports to someone that they're both dead. What we then basically learn is that not only does this beach have this weird time glitch going on with it, but the hotel is also a front for a group of researchers doing like immoral human experiments. Essentially, they start by picking people with various diseases, everything from mental health problems to epilepsy. And then when they get to the hotel, they give them a drink laced with various experimental medicine. Then they usher them to the beach, observe what happens to them. And due to time moving faster on the beach, they can see how these medicines would affect people over a longer period of time. But big bad science made a big bad mistake. As a new family arrives to the hotel and are just about to be fed their laced drinks, the drinks gets knocked over by the brother and sister from the beach. They're still alive. Listen up, everyone. There's a beach over here and it makes you old. Technically, I think it's the rocks on the beach that make you old, not the actual beach itself. Whatever. Listen, all these hotel people, they forced us to go there yesterday and now everyone we know is dead. But at least we can take solace in the fact that we are now revealing this to the world so that these experiments may never again happen. And guess how much Dan is like, No, 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 I can't believe that they revealed our plan to the world. Now everyone will know that the beach makes you old. Oh, it's fun. Yeah. The end. And so we have finally arrived at the final M. Night Shyamalan movie of this video. And hear me out here, this film came out this year. 2023. And what this means for me, or for us, is two things, essentially. Number one, Universal might be a bit more protective over this, and I kinda run the risk of having the video being taken down if I show too much of the movie, despite this definitely falling under transformative content, but we all know that that doesn't really matter on YouTube. But even if that's unlikely to happen, number two, I'm already, in general, a little bit apprehensive of recapping full movies, 
face, ironically enough, which is why I leave out a lot of details, because I'm trying to make it so that you can watch this, and yes, it'll spoil the movie, but you still would get a lot out of watching it yourself. And I kind of figure that when the movies are older, if you wanted to see them, you would have already, or at least you'd use the chapters to skip down here. But when the movie is newer, I feel extra weird about just like giving everything away. Like at the end of the day, the point of this video is for me to sing M. Night Shyamalan's praises. So the last thing I'd want to do is kind of, you know, mess with the numbers of the latest M. Night Shyamalan project, the one where the suits probably are still counting the numbers to determine how to, I guess, like budget for his upcoming projects. So I came up with a solution that I think is pretty decent. I'm gonna be talking through the setup of the movie, so about the first third or so. Then I'm gonna be skipping ahead to the good scene, which is somewhere in the last third of the movie. And then it's up to you if you actually wanna, you know, find out everything that happens, and then you can go and stream it for yourself. This way, what I'll be doing is essentially the same thing as a trailer. Present you with the premise of the movie and give you just enough to pique your interest, but without spoiling all of it, but still probably spoiling a little bit too much. Quick side note, hey, uh, people at production companies that decide how the trailers should be, could you stop spoiling so much in trailers? I hate that these days if I see a trailer for something I'm stoked about, uh, I only watch 20 seconds and if I'm like, ooh, this is interesting, then I have to turn it off because I know you'll inevitably fucking ruin the movie. It wasn't like this 15 years ago. Now I'm the old man yelling at the clouds, but please stop this. Okay, so here's the setup for Knock at the Cabin. This girl and her two gay dads go to a cabin in the woods. There, the girl meets this big scary looking guy who says that he's very sorry for what he's about to do to them. She goes inside and tells her dad that there's a strange man outside. They lock themselves in, but soon enough the large man knocks at the door, demanding to be let in. The family obviously refuses and tries to call the cops, but the phone lines have been cut and soon the people make their way into the house. The gay dads get tied to chairs and we find that the group that have come here consists of Large Man, Nurse Girl, Crazy Eyes and Ronald Weasley. They explain to the family that they've all had these weird visions which have brought them all here. They didn't know each other just a few days ago, but their visions brought them together and now they're here to force whoever was in this house to make a horrible decision. One family member has to die and the rest of the family has to agree on who it is. Obviously, uh, these dads are not super into this idea, but then the group explains that if they don't do this, everyone will die. Like literally everyone, the, the, the world is gonna come to an end if they don't sacrifice one. So what will they do? Will they let the world perish just to save a loved one? Or will they make the hardest decision of their lives? Or are these people crazy? Is this whole apocalypse story even true? These questions and many more answered in Knock at the Cabin. Okay, so let's get to the good scene. As I said before, it happens during the last third of the film. And again, since you might not have watched it, uh, I'll keep it, you know, kind of vague in a way. Sorry about that. But if you do go and see it after this, you'll totally get what I'm talking about. So after the main events of the film have all taken place, we find ourselves in the calm after the storm. Father and daughter are sitting in their car. The emotional trauma they have suffered through is indescribable, and for the first time in what feels like days, they now find themselves in the first moment of verifiable safety. The silence is deafening. Not a word is uttered between the two, for what use would words be? He turns the key in the ignition, and the radio turns on. An upbeat, feel-good 70s style song starts playing loudly out of the car's speakers. We've heard this song before. In an earlier scene, we watched the family as they drove their car towards the cabin, one of the dads loading up their favorite song on Spotify, and the three of them loudly singing along for what we now know was likely the last time. In silent shock, the both of them stare at the stereo, the song now oozing of an almost spiteful irony, a mean-spirited reminder of what used to be, but is no more. He reaches out and turns the stereo off. The last thing they need are more reminders. Again, silence fills the car. She looks up at him, hesitates for a second, and then leans towards the stereo, 
turning it back on, perhaps to allow the memories to come, perhaps to comfort her father, perhaps in an attempt to lighten the mood, perhaps without knowing why she does it. The same upbeat feel-good music fills the car yet again. He says nothing, his eyes somewhere else, somewhere distant. Still not a word has been spoken. After a couple more moments of the music seemingly contradicting every and all emotion currently at display from the two in the car, she reaches for the stereo and turns it back off. Perhaps I'm reading too much into it, or perhaps she feels apologetic in this moment. I'm sorry, I thought it would help to remember. She seemingly communicates, still, without a word. The silence returns, now more smothering than ever. Then, without meeting her eyes, he reaches for the stereo one final time. Once again, the music flows out of the speakers. He continues to stare off into the distance, but then he swallows once and decides to meet her gaze. They lock eyes and he grabs her hand. They look at each other for what might as well be a few seconds or a couple of hours, and then he lets her hand go, backs the car up, and they drive away. Still not a word has been spoken. The end. So it's come to this. I mean, I guess I knew it was coming, I just didn't expect it to come so soon. Over the months it's taken me to research, consume, write, record and edit every piece of this video, I've desperately tried to find a way around this. <laughs> it doesn't really count though, he didn't write it completely by himself. I argued. Well, wouldn't that apply to After Earth as well, then? A voice inside of me boomed. Okay, well, after the movie had wrapped, the studio apparently made several changes that M. Night didn't even sign off on. I pleaded. Oh, I'm sorry. The voice mocked. I guess I didn't know that the title of the video was I watched every single M. Night Shyamalan movie to find something good. Except for one of them. And I knew he was right. I had to face the beast. Each of M. Night's films in their own unique way has taught me to listen for the little things that otherwise might have passed me by unnoticed. A voice inflection here, a line delivery there, all presenting me with something of undeniable value. I'll admit that at times I had my doubts at the prospects of doing this video, at times I had to watch something twice, even thrice, but more often than not, the scene practically jumped out of the screen at me. But then, there was one. And you must believe me, I scoured each scene, I scrutinized every frame, the scenography, costumes, musical score, hell, even the background extras, all painstakingly examined in the hope of unearthing a glimmer of brilliance, anything at all. Yet for each rewatch, each hour wasted, each release date pushed by yet another week, I could feel the ever-growing, overwhelming presence of an undeniable truth refusing to be ignored. There was simply nothing to be found here. And as much as it pains me to admit, I knew I had been beat. If there was anything of value to take away from the 2010 M. Night Shyamalan directed and co-written film The Last Airbender, I was not capable of finding it. The premise that I had built my entire video around was a lie. I was a fraud and a failure to myself, 
to my audience and most of all to M. Night. I've heard it being said that in the pursuit of art there's beauty in every creation, a hidden gem waiting to be discovered. But if so, what does it mean when you dig and dig and dig only to come up empty-handed? Can a piece of art truly be devoid of any redeeming qualities? I began planning how to explain to my patrons over at patreon.com slash why I didn't have a new video after over two months of alleged work. Trying to find the words to adequately describe my inability to seemingly ever succeed with anything I take on, I kept turning it over in my mind. How could a person write and direct the 2002 Mel Gibson and Jacqueline Phoenix sci-fi thriller Signs and then go on to make this? Something so completely devoid of creative intent. Not a single trace of artistic vision, zip, nada, nothing. In a way, I thought to myself, it's almost impressive to be able to create something so unabashedly uninspired. Something in and of itself so completely lack of... It struck me as a bolt of lightning. How could I have been so blind? The value of The Last Airbender isn't in its elusive virtues, nor in its misguided storytelling or ill-fated execution. It took me 13 years to see it, but it's clear as day now. The value of The Last Airbender is and has always been in its role as a measuring piece. A reference point, a, a, a contrasting dark shade against the colorful spectrum of cinematic artistry in the realm of art. Beauty is subjective, yet standards and benchmarks help us navigate this boundless sea of expression. And that's where the last airbender excels. A reference point allows us to define the dark from the light. To appreciate the heights that art can reach by contrasting it against its depths. The last airbender may not have bestowed upon us any discernible treasures, but it gifted us something far more valuable. Perspective. Before airbender, the village was fine. Before airbender, science was great. But in this post-airbender world, the village is a greatly underappreciated gem, and sign stands tall as the cinematic peak of early 2000s filmmaking. It's a reminder that art in all its forms is a journey of triumphs and tribulations. It's a testament that sometimes the greatest value of work can hold is not in its own greatness, but in the reflection it casts upon an entire artistic tapestry. Or in other words, the last airbender is the absolute best at being the worst. The last airbender, directed by M. Night Shyamalan, released in 2010 by Paramount Pictures, stinks better than any other film. Also, it's the choreography. The choreography of The Last Airbender uh, is actually uh, the best part of it. So if you were going to leave like a comment saying that I didn't like I didn't actually do it or or that, you know, it was a cop out. I look forward to pointing you to this part because you probably went down uh, to write it before this because this is at the very end, uh, most likely. So it's the choreography. Fuck you. Thank you for watching.